All right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host for today's program. On Standing for Truth, we defend the truth of biblical creation. We also host some awesome guests here on the program. Today, it is a privilege to have Peter Line here with me once again for this valuable program. Dr. Peter Line and our, uh, I are going to continue our comprehensive examination of the hominin fossil record. We will be discussing icons of human evolution, such as the Australopithecines, Neanderthals, Erectus, Homo naledi, and more. Peter, thank you so much for, again, being so generous with your time. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, yeah. It's great to have you again, uh, Peter. What I'll do before we get into your slides and presentation is I'd like to give you a formal introduction. And for anybody unfamiliar with you, they can see the description box of this video where they can find links to your articles and uh, our previous show that we did on this program that was comprehensive. <laughs> we went for over three hours and touched on a number of topics. <clears throat> and so, okay, here we go. Peter's undergraduate majors were in biophysics and instrumental science. After this, he completed master's and PhD degrees in the area of neuroscience, focusing on brain electrophysiology, and spent over a decade involved in such research. Subsequently, he worked as a university lecturer, teaching in the area of anatomy and physiology for over a decade. Peter has been interested in the creation evolution issue ever since becoming a Christian, as evolution was a stumbling block to him, believing God's word was true. He has had a particular interest in the so-called hominid fossils for many years and has published several articles on the topic. Now, since this is part two of our ongoing series, examining the evidence for human evolution. I do want to, again, remind people in the audience, please check out part one, which can be found in the description box of this video. Now what I wanna do is hand it over to uh, Peter. Firstly, how are you doing today? I've, I've been looking forward to this one for a while, Peter. And uh, I guess we'll just kinda get right into your presentation, my brother. All right, thanks, Donnie. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing quite well, thank you. So, um. Today, today uh, I'm going to look at, uh, firstly, uh, the hobbit, uh, officially known as Homo floresiensis, and then Homo naledi, and I don't know what else, would it be time for much more else. Um, but before starting that, I'll just have a look at, a brief look at uh, cretinism, because that's kind of my working hypothesis about what may explain some of the strange features we see in some of these um, specimens in, in both places. And um, so I thought uh, just to spend a very, very brief time just explaining what cretinism is uh, and then go to the, discuss a bit about the Hobbit, which helps then uh, un understand maybe what I'm talking about when we get to Homo naledi. And so with cretinism, Basically, um, it's so, sort of related to a goiter. So in, in a sense that where there's a, um, a prevalence of goiter in a population, you may find a small percentage of cretinism depending on the severity of the, of, of the situation. So, so goiter, as you can see on, on a slide, it's a swelling of the neck from an enlarged thyroid gland and it's usually caused by iodine deficiency and usually a, a correlation exists between the prevalence of endemic goiter and cretinism and, and uh, basically iodine deficiency is fundamental in the etiology of endemic cretinism in whatever area it's found and, uh, uh, and is believed to cause damage to the thyroid um, during fetal life. I'll just give that. I'll have to move my mouse to get to the next slide. Okay, so here here indicates uh, this is a survey from the World Health Organization, uh, 1960. So 
goiter and criticism is, is probably less of a problem now uh, in most regions of the world because um, we, we have an idea what causes it and so put, you put iron in in the in, a, in, in supplements or whatever in the in the, um, in the food and, and uh, that helps kind of eliminate it but they have done surveys in the past and this shows some of the uh, the regions that uh, goiter has been found in and this shows Africa and you notice the blue arrow there that is there's a sort of a, a, a belt there stretching for about 300 miles a narrow belt um, in, in sort of uh, that part of South Africa and that belt is is in the vicinity of the cradle humankind area of South Africa and that's where the rising star cave site is located now and we're not going to talk about that today but you can see there's in Asia and 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 Europe uh, basically you can see here or part of Europe at least you can see uh the blue line that indicates in the in the Caucasus region uh where goiter has been found and so it's quite prevalent there and that's where the Damanese Homo erectus specimens were found in Damanese Georgia now endemic cretin is it's the most severe severe manifestation of iron deficiency in a diet and there's generally two subtypes there's neurological and hypothyroid cretinism so in neurological cretin endemic cretinism uh they tend to be more normal stuff stature but may have a severe neurological defects um, usually they're born with a functioning thyroid gland so damage occurs in the first couple of uh, or first seven months of, of, of fetal life now individual hyperthyroid mixed dermatitis endemic cretinism i think i'll just stick to calling it hyperthyroid cretinism it's easier to pronounce uh, they may be accompanied by a host of clinical features including dwarfism dwarfism uh the, the neuro neurological deficit deficits may be less um now um endemic cretinism as i already shown diarrhea it can, it, it can occur it has occurred throughout the world but its morphological traits the, the anatomy um can vary substantially um and uh, major characters such as dwarfism and certain neurological disorders may be prominent in some areas but not in others <clears throat> um, so here's a bit about i may actually skip some of this um but it's sort of um the um it just shows that some of the research on that credit as a result of thyroidal damage during fetal life or, or in early infancy um it's, it's a bit of redundant information here so i'm gonna try to skip some of this to move things along um so hyperthyroid creditism has major development effects causing bony deformities mental retardation and more and is basically caused by iron de deficiency in the unborn um it's common areas with low environmental iodine, uh, where there is low environmental iodine, and also where there's high incidence of adult goiter. Um, now, uh, here's, here's some definition by Peter Brown, who actually he he doesn't believe uh, homophorosis is, is not um, is 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 not a modern human with cretinism. It is written a paper on it actually i don't eat it i don't believe it's a modern human i, I believe it's a, a robust what i call a robust human which is sort of an erectus like human with cretinism um but he, he has other ideas but he about homo floresiensis of course he was the first author of the first major paper on homo floresiensis so um he, he uh so he's studying a neuro neurological cretins are the offspring of severely iodine deficient mothers who could not provide sufficient thyroxine that's the the thyroid hormone of the thyroid hormones main ones uh, who could not provide sufficient thyroxine 
to the fetus during the first seven months of preg pregnancy. Now, uh, and this used to be very common uh, uh, before medical intervention. Now, the hyperforid uh, cretins suffer from fetal rather than maternal thyroid deficiency in the last tri uh, trimester of gestation. Uh, and so I guess that that's when it starts to, um, it, the, the thyroid, its own thyroid gland has been developed by then and, and is starting to produce uh, its own thyroid hormones, but it's not getting the iodine necessary to actually produce the thyroid horm hormone. So, uh, um, and and so basically that can result in thyroid atrophy. And so when, when the newborn is born, it has a, a dysfunctional thyroid and so in the carpet who produce the hormones and uh, and so um basically uh even so even if you give it iodine then that may not help that much it uh it you, you need to supplement it with the uh, give it uh say thyroxine or thyroid hormone it to make it to make so that the, it will the baby or the, the newborn will develop not uh, relatively normally um <laughs> now, so there's there's a lot of um the, this distinction between the two forms of cretinism uh um it's it's sort of unclear whether the two forms of these disease can be separated by the by the development of particular sets of skeletal and dental traits um and but the the um the crucial factor is that the thyroid deficiency is present is is present during growth um and he goes on, so stature is often reported as dwarf, but the range extends from 82 centimetres to 1.61 centimetres. So there's a lot of range there. Um, you know, I don't know, you've probably seen pictures of uh, people with cretinism. They very can be very, very short, but not all of them are, only some. So... Um, so now we're kind of starting to zoom and get a, getting closer to um, Indonesia where the uh, Homo floresiensis were found. And so th this is a Obendorf, Oxnard and Kefford. So these were promoting the idea in the early days of the Hobbit con controversy that the that we that the the Hobbit could be explained by uh, hyperfluoric cretinism. And I say it's a it's uh, it was a uh, that the, this cretinism was a form of dwarfism present in, in Indonesia in recent times and at high prevailing rates of up to 4.7% in Central Africa and and is an environmental disorder with potential to be maintained within a population indefinitely, unlike genetic dwarfisms that are subject to natural selection. So basically, uh, my I don't pretend that I don't have all the answers and it, my my thing is a working hypothesis. There may be better things to explain it, but one thing with cretinism, it, it yeah, it, it, you don't have to wait for mutations to to go through the population. It's just the environment, and natural selection doesn't can't get rid of it. You know, it's it's just a matter of you know. So so it can ex, explain why uh, uh, you get a certain percentage of people straight away with with cretinism, or whatever. If they live in an iodine deficient area, you don't. Have, it's not a sort of you don't have a waiting time problem, and so, and and for other reasons as well as we'll, we'll get to. And so that so they um, so they hop, hypothesize that LB1 and LB6. So they they're the two two of the LB1 is the main individual that which has the uh, a, a part of the skeleton and and the skull. LB6 is also, I think it has a jaw and some other, um, um, a, a shoulder blade and some other parts, finger, uh, some some finger bones and stuff like that. They hypothesize that both these are cretins from an inland population are mostly unaffected modern humans, homo sapiens. Um, so they're basically born without a function thyroid due to environmental factors, including iron deficiency. And the resulting it can lead to severe dwarfism and reduced brain size, but less severe mental rotation and motor disability than in neurological cretinism. So uh, the um, 
there, there's a there is a great uh, so, so this is a paper by Chen 2010 revisiting cretinism so there's like there is a great asian effect of, of um iron inefficiency so basically um the uh the most serious and visible is is the endemic cretinism which occurs from about one to ten percent in a severely iodine deficient population okay so it's not the whole population it's just a relatively small population a small part of that population will have it although um for whatever reason it may be that those with cretinism may may shelter a group together for whatever reasons we don't know so you you could get a, a certain concentration but overall it's going to only going to be a small percentage that have it and but you haven't the, the next gradation is that of less severe brain damage uh and that um this lesser effect is much more common up to 30 percent than gross cretinism uh and so as and as state there it's already indicated in china terms such as subcretin or cretinoid are used to describe these subjects i don't know what the skeletal effects are and on this sort of lesser graded um uh, group and and then you have a lot apart from goiter uh the less common the, the more common effect uh is um mental and physical energy or exhaustion due to hypothyroidism so this is this is this can be reversed by iodine deficiency and things like that. So. Right. Now, the all the cretins they're not all identical. Uh, so according to Oxnard, they're enormously more variable than unaffected humans in many features, as would be expected in a pathology with different degrees of effect and conflation of associated conditions. So there may be more. So there may be other conditions too, and I, I think even even in the as we get at home in le sample there may be other conditions at play too uh, and of course all cretins they're not identical um the effects of the deficiency vary at a greater or lesser degree their genetic heritages can also be expected to influence the picture and most of the known cretins for which postmortem reports are available are from european populations so we don't know that much about other populations uh, it's more the european ones now um that's already is it, is it now the hypothyroidism can reduce brain size by approximately 50 percent and may not do that in all but that that's what the thing is that's what the oxnard uh, over north oxnard um and kefford um right and so they state uh well, well oxnard state later in a paper following up that there's normal southeast asian pigment cranium from about 800 to 1000 milliliters have been recorded and estimated on this basis cretin from such population could have brain size as small as four to five hundred milliliters based on scaling of height and brain size found among european endemic cretins and so uh, and i i don't believe it's a, a modern human cretin i believe it's a sort of erectus type or robust human cretin and we know that they for some unknown reason they there's many with, with, with generally smaller brain size than the average human although there are there are some that are actually have very large brain sizes but they're not categorized erectors because by definition these days if I, anything if a robust human has a large you know with with thick uh, wall, uh, cranial walls and and brow ridges and things like that if they if they have that with a large brain then they usually uh, then they're kind of excluded by definition from erectors and so they're called something like archaic or homo sapiens or homo hodobagensis or something like that so that that's why anyhow but anyhow so and so um uh, if you have a homo erectus population which generally has small brain size any uh, anyhow then it's it's easy to see how if they had something like cretinism that, that their brains that if you re re reduce that a little bit further and you get a brain size in the range of homo floresiensis and also in the range of homo nalili and on the right there you can see that's a that's a sort of uh modern human cretinism uh, aphorotic cretin so it had a, a absent uh fire gland at birth and so that its height was 0.85 meters so it's a dwarfed um cretin person there okay 
And now another thing is, according to Oxnard, and now Charles Oxnard, he's a hostile witness. He's an evolutionist, um, but he, and he's a he's a he's a very knowledgeable person. You know, and knows a lot about bones, written a lot. So this 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 guy is not a. Yeah, you have to take seriously what he's right. And he, he states, it is remarkable that so many features similar to those normally present in great apes, in Australopithecus and Paranthropus and in early Homo, for example, Homo erectus and even to some degree Homo neanderthalensis, but not in modern Homo sapiens, are generated in humans by growth deficit due to the absence of thyroid hormone. In other words, many of the pathological features of cretinism mimic the primitive characters of evolution, making it easy to mistake pathological features for primitive characters so bear that in mind you know and i'll go through at least a couple of things that some of the things that he explains um that look like features of evolution but if you look more closely there's a, there's a you can explain it differently okay so now we get to homo floresiensis okay okay so now on, on thursday 28th october 2000 four there was headlines across the world about uh such as from the age newspaper in australia such as lost race of human hobbits unearthed on indian on the eastern island and so that captured the ima imagination of the um, news media and so this this hoopla uh, surrounding this new alleged species officially known homo floresiensis uh, was enormous and if it was true, it'd probably be justified, you know. It, it, you know, it's certainly big news, but it's a big if. Um, it, this this um, species has been really steeped in controversy from the word go. It's eased off a little bit, but uh, we'll talk more about that later. And that's mainly because some of the participants and participants in the controversy have passed have passed away, and also they redated it to make it, uh, yeah. But we'll get to that. Okay. Now, the official publication uh, occurred in Nature. And as I mentioned earlier, principal author was Peter Brown, from a paleoanthropologist from the University of New England, Australia. He, he, he reconstructed a cranium of the type specimen, LB1. Now, co author was Michael Morgan. So he pa passed away about 10 years ago. And he was an archaeologist and, professor at the, and a professor at the University of Wollongong, Australia. And he, he was the driving force behind the overall pro project. And without him, this, this odd specimens would not have been found. So here's the skull. Here's a, a cast of the skull. So basically from Liambua, light is a limestone cave of Flores Island, Indonesia. It was discovered in 2003. Um, estimated crane capacity is the, the latest mo one or mo it's about 426 when they published it it was a bit less uh, so they've done previous more es subsequent estimates of it and a little bit larger now it's allegedly dated to between 100,000 to 60,000 years ago now, of course i don't accept these dates um but i give them for you know because of, so you know uh out of interest and, and stuff like that it was, it was initially dated to eighteen thousand years ago and and there's a section towards the end i'll, I'll discuss more on the dating so i won't get into that now and it's estimated to be about 106 centimeters in stature so about the same height as as lucy so so what was homo fluorescensis now there have been certain evolutionary expla explanations which has changed a bit um so when it was first published, it was a, a new dwarfed Homo erectus species. So basically some sort of island dwarfing hypothesis and uh, uh, limited resources or whatever. So basically shrunk in size uh, over time. Um, some believe it was just a variant Homo erectus. Uh, some believe it was a new species derived from Homo habilis, which I believe is just a phantom species mainly made up of specimens that should be Australian. Uh, assigned to the um, genus Australopithecus or a, or a separate genus altogether. Um, or it was derived from some Australopithecine like biped. Um, it, it, I guess one of the problems with that is that no Australopithecine nor 
alleged homo habilis specimen that have been found outside of Africa. So to be, be so, um, yeah. And um, so that would be the first one then or, or something like that, but there's no trace of them outside Africa. And also the, um, the dwarfed homo erectus hypothesis get, kind of gets a rebirth in 2011. So, so it's sort of come back again, although right now there's different people have different uh, opinions on it. But that's just the evolutionary explanations, okay? So there been, there's been a lot of, uh, before before the redating, there was a lot of possible human pathologies, okay? Uh, and so and certainly one at the top of the list was a human with microcephaly. Uh, and certainly in, in the early days, I thought that that was a plausible possibility. Um, Laron syndrome, I got an endemic cretinism. So that was proposed several years later. Down syndrome, been praised, or an unspecified development, mental abnormality. So that's hedging all bets, I suppose. And uh, one guy, Richard, suggests basically a, a combined growth form, insulin like growth factor, one axis modification and chasing of the MCPH gene family. So a lot of different explanations, and, and there's probably more, more than that. And my goal is not to kind of try and explain all these things position or contrast these positions. Uh, just have a drink. So basically, I'll just discuss some of the features of interest and along the plausible explanations involving cretinism where relevant. Okay. Now, um, could so firstly, could cretinism have occurred in Flores? Now, in the, in the Mangarai district of Flores, where the LB1 partial skeleton was found, the total to the total gorge rate was 41% in 1998. This had increased by um, a further 11% to 52% by 2004. So that's from Charles Oxnard now. So he writes, the current gorge rate rates imply that poor indigenous hill groups in the Flores should have produced some cretins, though it must be emphasised that these have not yet been reported. Today's gorge rates imply that prior hunter gatherers populations, the hills should have been severely iron de deemed deficient and would regularly have produced cretins. He, he goes on to say, Leeing Bua itself is a limestone cave, and nearby soils are alkaline and probably therefore iron deficient. deficiency. Um, and uh, fish bones found at Leeing Bua are real fish that would be deficient in iodine. Um, river waters in such regions alone. Iodine. All these factors would have precluded access to iodine rich seafoods. So, at least in theory, it, it's, it's certainly possible. Okay, so just to establish, uh, wanted to establish that. Now, um, just a note on on from, from someone else. John Allen writes in the lives of the of the brain, taken as a whole, including both its morphology and provenance, the Hobbit that is. Homo, Homo floresiensis, particularly the LB1 skeleton, fits about as well into accept the view of hominid evolution, especially with reference to cranial capacity as the Piltdown hoax. Piltdown was a combination of the human cranium with an ape jaw, indicating a cranial expansion was relatively early among the mosaic of changes that combined to produce modern humans. The hobbit, if it is indeed non pathological, challenges implicit assumption about the process, the processes underlying hominid brain evolution. I think a lot of we'll get onto it later on. Hopefully, a lot of the things coming out of the Rising Star K system, similar challenge in a lot of old theories, and that I think that's why there's a lot of pushback to it from certain quarters. But we'll get back to that later. So now, looking at the postcranial anatomy, sort of the not not looking at the skull, uh, shoulders. Shoulders are not designed for cli for climbing. If you there's 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 a scapula not not from the LB1 uh, skeleton, but a different specimen is a is a scapula, and you can measure the angles, uh, have an idea of the orientation of the shoulder joint, and it, and it indicates that it it was it wasn't particularly the uh, cranially orientated. So that indicates it it wasn't really designed for climbing. Now, now, feet are not used for grasping, but were very long. You know, you, you had a the, the um, 
toes, the, the big toe was aligned with the, the other toes, but they were long, very long, and we'll discuss that. Stature similar to Australopithecines, but also consistent with dwarfism, which is a feature of cretinism. Now, iliac ablator hip bones flare laterally in LB1. That is, lateral flaring is also a feature in cretinism. <laughs> now, LB1 shows increased robusticity of limb bones. Um, um, and cretinism can give appearance of robusticity, and, and um, I think I think I discussed that too later. From it. so, let, let's just look at the uh, the foot of Homo floresiensis. So, so in um, in the, one of the papers, it, the authors more um, would state the foot of LB1 has a broad array of primitive traits that we call apes and some australopithecines. And here you can see the, uh, the upper part is the medial view, uh, which has the kind of the uh, the big well, where the big toe would be, but the, at least the metatarsal um, first metatarsal is the nearest on the, is, is kind of on the bottom or or on the side there nearest to you, and um, and dorsal view, which is the top view of the of the foot. And, um, and and also shown in here with the, the right tibia and left femur and the bottom. Now, according to Jung, uh, LB1's foot is exceptionally long relative to the femur and tibia, proportions never before documented in hominins but seen, son, seen in some African apes. Now, Oxnard has looked at that and basically what it, it says is, Though cretins have absolutely small feet, they have even shorter limbs, so that the ratios of foot length to leg length and lower limb, lower limb length have values 76 to 84 percent and 35 to 43 percent similar to apes. Further, LB1 has ape-like metatarsal and phalangeal ratios and ape-like morphology of individual tarsal bones. Again, these same features are also found in cretins. It goes on to say, cretin bones are enormously variable. Some, especially in upper limb, are slender and, and with thin cortices, possibly related to relating to reduced physical activity. Others, especially in the lower limb, tend to be wider in relation to the lengths and thus appear more robust. This is partly because the reduction of, of the width of bones due to reduced appositional growth on bone surfaces is less than reduction of length of bones due to reduced multiplicative growth of cartilage at bone ends. Reduction of growth in general dust tends to reduce length more than widths, giving rise to a spurious appearance of robusticity. Such uh, a mixture of features is also evident in LB1. So basically, uh, okay, I'll go back to what, what appears to be some strange feet, uh, or ape like feet, uh, look for different lenses. Uh, can explain by, by development pathology such as cretinism. And uh, I emphasize again, Oxnard is an evolutionist, so it's a hostile listener. He's an expert on bones. Um, so, you know, don't, you don't need to take my word for it, you know, but that's what he says. So let's look at another thing. Look, look at the hands. The wrist bones of the hand of Albion have been described as being primitive, similar to those found in apes or australopithecines, particularly the shape and small size of the trapezoid. So you can see the arrow there pointing to trapezoid uh, bone, which is situ situated next to the index finger, the first finger next to the, the thumb, basically. Okay. Now, however, this primitive trapezoid shape is also seen in cretinism. Uh, according to Oxnard, the small trapezoids do have a sometimes occur in adult human cretins because there may be delayed ossification of the ventral portion of the bone. So basically, the, when they ossify, it's you, different parts and they later come together. But um, so basically, there may be delayed ossification of the ventral portion of the bone in younger cretins or failure of fusion of the two parts of the bone with loss of the small ventral portion after death. So it may so that so it may not have fused by the time it died, and then that's been lost, and then then it's been interpreted as a ape-like um, trapezoid. And it, and he mentioned a young adult cretin uh, shows exactly such an incomplete 
trapeze side lacking a ventral tip adjacent to a normal capita. And that's a, from a basalt specimen 84 male. So again, you, you look at it for a different lens and, and it has a diff, very different interpretation, you know. And you should do because Homo, uh, Hobbit is, is a very strange specimen. And so, so why shouldn't people consider pathology in these instances? And I already mentioned cretinism can reduce brain size to at least I oxygen don't reckon up to about uh fifty percent or something like that. So so and because you have um cranial in the region have been estimated to be between eight hundred and one thousand mil, theoretically it could explain this the small cranial capacity or brain size of of the hobbit. Okay, now according to Kaifu et al., who analyzed the cranium of Homo floresiensis and, and, uh, and other crania, LB1 is most similar to early Javanese Homo erectus from Sangerian and Trinul and these and other aspect, aspects. We conclude that the cranial facial morphology of LB1 is consistent with the hypothesis that Homo floresiensis evolved from early Javanese Homo erectus with dramatic island dwarfism. So this is sort of the, I guess, the rebirth of the dwarfed Homo erectus hypothesis that some features it, it aligns with it. So I've shown there um, a photo of the side view of the Hobbit skull and the Sagerian seventeen Homo erectus skull from Java, which is which is supposedly dated one point two five million years ago or whatever, whatever it is now. That those dates seem to change all the time. The alleged dates that is. Um, and again, this this shows the the, the um, LB1 Hobbit compared with the modern Cretan skull. Like I said, I don't I don't believe it's a uh, um, I don't I don't believe it's a modern human Cretanism. I believe it's a rectus or robust type human Cretanism. And it's it's interesting that. Uh, there's a lot of people now evolution are, are suggesting that because of because of a lot of research into the denisovans that a lot, a lot of the chinese fossils may be denisovans but also the nangdong homo erectus specimens might actually be um denisovans and um for for for, for a number of reasons and um of course the denisovans and we know that from the dna that they actually interbred with modern humans and Neanderthals and so uh, there isn't there's no there's no well there's trace of Denisovan DNA in the inhabitants of Flores the 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 population there but that they haven't found any sort of other archaic so-called archaic whatever um DNA represented in it they, they found some trace of Denisovan and Neanderthal but that but they also haven't analyzed no one has yet analyzed it being able to get dna from homo erectus or homo floresiensis so you could have that so floris so so the it could be that uh flora the hobbit was erect was a denisovan was also erectus or it was a product of a modern human and a denisovan and and if it and um something like that so it's sort of uh so this this is all um hopefully they can um analyze it more get more ancient dna to kind of, which may help help solve some of the mysteries but unfortunately i can't it doesn't seem lb1 isn't kind of giving up its dna sequence easily now um the so so the, certainly in the early days the um homo the let me call it hobbit easier the hobbit was compared to a microcell a micros, uh, considered to be microcephalic uh microcephalic modern human and uh here here just shows a a comparison of a, of a, a modern microcephalic skull compared to homo floresiensis okay um and uh Lewis looked at this and one study taking all these differences together we conclude that the material from Lingenburg cannot be considered a microcephalic modern human an alternative hypothesis that albion is a microcephalic homo erectus 
cannot be dismissed entirely because such microcephalics would cluster with Homo erectus just as microcephalic Homo sapiens cluster with the rest of Homo sapiens. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, uh, they, what they found was that, that the cranial shape of LB1 is closer to that of Homo erectus and Gerin 17 and not Homo sapiens. They say the overall cranial shape of LB1 appears to be very distinct from that of modern humans and closer to that of Homo erectus. The difference from Homo habilis is much smaller, but clearly larger than between Homo erectus and Homo floresiensis. Therefore, based on the available data, we may conclude that Homo floresiensis is morphol morphologically closest to Homo erectus from Sengirin. Um, another microcephalic study found that uh, uh, Manu uh, Manushi et al. found that LB1 endocasts fell largely outside the range of modern normal human and homo erectus endocasts, but were within the range of microcephalic endocasts. Uh, and they state, given the available evidence, it is clearly premature to assign LB1 and associated skeletal, skeletal finds to a distinct homo species. The existence of a single skull and only a few mandibles provides many clues as to the type of hominid who inhabited forests 12 to 18,000 year, years ago. Okay. So here, here we get to um, so this so you know the I, I'm not going to go into too much more on the, the, the whole bit except look at it dating but um, the work by um, if you if you want to look more into that in in a book called ghostly Ring, ghostly muscles wrinkled brains heresies and hobbits there's a lot on a lot on cretinism and, and homofluorescence there where it goes through a lot of the features that are present and, and and there's several papers on it too which are in the slide so so the people can read more about it there but um on the dating um initially um they, they was dated they used various dating methods uh radiocarbon luminescence uranium series and active spin resonance and i said it that homo fluorescence existed from before 13 38,000 years ago until at least 18,000 years ago, which was the date LB1. Um, and that Homo floresiensis originated from early dispersal of Homo erectus, including specimens referred to as Homo ergaster and Homo geologicus, which is the Damanisi ones, that reached forests and then survived in this island refuge until very recently. It overlapped significantly in time of Homo sapiens in the region, but we do not know if or how the two species interacted. And, and and things like that so um now what happened is that and, and so because because uh i'll get back to it because it overlaps significantly in time of homo sapiens and region then it it gave room for people to suggest that human pathologies are modern humans because they could be it would, it would be in the region too but when they redated it then it put the kind of more out of reach of explaining at least as pathology modern human for at least for those that subscribe to evolutionary uh, theory. So the initial ages were discarded in 2016, um, and new techniques including uh, uranium thorium infrared stimula simulated luminescence dating, thermal luminescence, radiocarbon dating on charcoal and and argon argon efforts, and basically. Um, so that so they found found that um i just uh, that basically did so suggest that homo fluorescences survived until long after modern human reached australia by uh well that, that sorry they were dated to about the, the the initial dating was um that they survived to about long after the fifty thousand years and that basically the new dates um basically didn't support these ages uh and so that the date for the holotype LB1 at 18,000 years was wrong. And so uh, instead, the skeletal remains of Homo floresiensis in a deposit containing them were dated to be, said to be dated to about 100,000 and 60,000 years ago, where stone artifacts attributable to this species were said to range from about 190,000 to 50,000 years ago. In a state where Homo floresiensis Floresiensis survived about 50,000 years ago, potentially encountering modern humans of flowers 
or other hominins dispersing throughout Southeast Asia, such as Denisovan, is an open question. So, so whatever the justification, it sort of made it harder now to to basically um, um, present to the hobbits to say that they were pathological modern humans. And um, it, it, I just go some of, some of the reason for redating it. I, I don't know whether it's right, right or wrong. I, I might skip that that part. Um, now, so so basically, the uh, the LB one specimen, which which was dated supposedly previously to eighty thousand years, yet now it's about sixty to one hundred thousand years ago. So it prepares to predate the arrival of Homo sapiens in the region, although that changes all the time too, uh, according to evolutionary timeline. So that makes it difficult to have a of pathological modern human. Now, what, whatever the justification for the redating, the new age reign was certainly convenient to those believing Homo floresiensis represents a new hominin species. And as indicated by Carolyn Gramling um, in an article, she writes, that that new much older date range of Homo floresiensis makes it impossible to argue that it is a pathology towards modern human, says Russell Gion, who's an who, a a paleoanthropologist at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, who was not involved in the study. In my opinion, this paper drives the final nail, nail in the coffin of that hypothesis. So, um, so you can see why that why you don't hear much about it, because that's mainly the reason why or maybe or certainly one of the reasons why now um so now where do those evolutionists uh who advocate the pathological modern human hypothesis were signed by new dating it's unclear but it may have some likely to have some effect but they have been quiet since but from my point of view and as a creationist uh, you know, I, I reject his dates, and so it doesn't really have any bearing on my interpretation of the Hobbit. But the, the redating just illustrates the fickle nature of age estimates obtained from dating efforts, as does the comment on it by John Hawkes. As a, I should have used the capital J in there, um, uh, who, who's a prominent paleoanthropologist and he's involved in the Homo and the, um, the Lady study. He, he writes a new understanding of the stratico, stratigraphy. Of Liang Bu is just one step in this process, and we should expect that the geologic aid of these fossils will continue to be refined. Indeed, the most current result may itself turn out to be wrong, and we'll need to change ideas again. Stranger things have happened before, much stranger. So, probably, didn't, so who knows what, what the dates will be in the future, but, but that's sort of what kind of happens. So, so, they, so the most likely scenario is that. Um, uh, what I believe is the most likely is that Homo floresiensis, the Hobbit, was it was a robust time human, so erectus like, or whether you call it Hobbitensis like, or Neanderthal like, or whatever, but, but it had cretinism, okay? And it may have been, it could even have been uh, ancestry of a robust human and a modern human, we just don't know. You, you can't rule out modern human cretinism and Microsoft, it's a possibility, but I don't. I think it unlikely if it, if it was a microcephalic, it'd probably more likely to be a, a microcephalic Homo erectus um, because that fits more the shape of the skull, which is sort of tends to group of erectus. Okay, that's just uh, some figures of stature and stuff like that. So basically, um, that um, includes this. The next is Homo lady. I don't, I don't, I'll, I'll just put it back to um, to. Uh, Donny, for a second, Are you just still there, Donny? Yes, very okay. good. So, so I'm just sorry. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so I'll just switch to the slide. So now I'm having a lead. Sure, I can. I can give you a couple questions that have come in. Yeah. Very comprehensive. That was great, and I feel like that is exactly what we need as young earth creationists is we, we need comprehensive explanations going through the primary source data as you've done. And so a lot of questions of clarification in the audience, Peter. Okay. So I guess my question in, in light of that, you're basically arguing rather than Hobbit being a pre-human evolutionary ancestor with basal or primitive traits, 
you're arguing that those traits are characteristic of pathology and disease rather than evolution. That's right. Yeah. You know, that, yeah, that, that, that's why you look at it from different lenses. In fact, it, it, it's not even me. I, I, I'm using the argument on, on expert. I'm, you know, Oxnard knows a lot more about bones than I do. So I'm using his arguments. Uh, right. But he, he's a, he, he knows a lot. And so, so, so they're the one arguing for it. And I'm just a, uh, I'm just using the arguments. But as I see, I'm, I'm looking at whether that's a plausible explanation from Homer and Letty as well. But which I'll later look at. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's the essential story of it. Yeah, that it, that they they were arguing that it was a modern human with pathology, with cretinism. I argue that probably is more likely that it was a rectus-like or 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 Denisovan rectus, whatever you want to call them, uh, type human uh, with with some pathology and, and cretinism may well explain it. So that's what I'm arguing, and and some, and if you look at the bones from a different perspective, you can you can explain it. But that's in that I'm quote arguing. you showed on screen from Oxner that you're talking about. He said many of the pathological features of cretinism mimic the primitive characters of evolution, making it yeah. easy to mistake pathological features for primitive yep. characters. I think that is incredibly revealing, uh, Peter. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, is it a, I'll go on the screen now. If you, if you, yes, if let's you put it up for the audience. It. Yeah, yeah. Could so you that, reiterate so the importance of that quote for the audience, Peter? Yeah, well, well, the thing is that like of the big feet were interpreted as some sort of evolutionary thing or whatever, or, or because the legs were shorter and whatever, it's interpreted as a more loosey like astralopithecine like but he explains, you know, it, it's a result of both have been reduced in growth, but the length of the the limb bones, the length of it is reduced more than the width of it. And the, the same with the feet, yeah, basically, so so the feet have shortened by less than the, the length of the limb bones uh, because of the nature of the disease, because it slows the rate of growth. The rate of growth is, is slower at the ends of the limb bones than it is in the width and stuff like that, and then in the feet. So that means that proportionally the feet look larger, even though overall they might may be smaller than a normal human. If I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So that's so sort of you got you got to look at yeah, you got to look at how it what parts of the bone is, is slow down in growth. The absence of thyroid hormone is essential for normal growth in tissue and the skeleton and, and basically um which is, and, and so it affects the growth of the, of the skeleton, but it may, but not all the skeleton grows at the same rate. And so, and, and you know, some, you know, bones in the, uh, the skull, the, you know, there's the, there's a the membrane fused between, you know, in, in the cranium, it's, it's membranes that fuse together, the, you know, you have the sutures and the membranes fuse together as you grow, uh, as you grow uh, into adulthood. In the long bones, you have, you have this, this sort of cartilage at the ends that can't end up fusing and stops growth. So there's different different things that grow and different, things grow at different rates. You know, the, yeah. the face, uh, the, you know, the lower face grows differently than the upper face. And and, and so there's, there's all these little, little things to, to take into account. What would be a good yeah. response to evolutionary critics, critics of our position that would say, well, the pathology we see today in modern humans, extant humans, is different than the type of traits or features that we see in what they would say are primitive humans like Hobbit, Floresiensis. And so it can't be due to pathology. It must be due to evolution, rather, uh, Peter. Well, well, I think I, think, I, think I just used the the... the Oxnard was actually arguing it was a pathological modern human. So mm. basically, so, so I, you know, I don't know. So, so that would, and in fact, all the pathology explanations by evolutionists have been have been that it was a modern human. That's a good well, point. Pretty much nearly all of them. So, so, so I, I think that counters that. You know that. Yeah. You know, you you, you have the same pathologies that there's that you have the same pathologies occurring in 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 both in both modern and and um, the, these robust humans. And there's a, there's, there's a lot of things about what you call modern humans, you know, but I, I don't think I can't go into today, but you know, when I, if I ever get to talk about Homo erectus, because, because what, 
because how you define modern humans is may not be as simple as you think. Well, who, who you include in it, uh, you know, because people right. people think that you know modern humans are the, the the vertical forehead and 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 round rounded occipital, no hardly any brow ridges. That that just doesn't hold, you know. If if you define it like that, you're going to exclude you know, a lot of people. So you have to be very careful how you actually, you know. So, so what? So so that so, so if defining things, you know, it's, it's not that simple. And 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 the postcranial skeleton of of the robust humans were not. But we're very similar to some differences in some specimen, but they were all pretty very similar to to modern humans. Right. And there's a lot of variation. And and it's mainly that the skull features, you know, uh, that are different. Like in Homo erectus, it's 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 more the the skull that's that that's the question. It's not really the postcranial skeleton so much. The flared iliac blade on the yeah. uh, Homo floresiensis specimen. Yeah. You're saying that could also be due to pathology and disease. Well, yeah, it is actually known to be due to pathology and disease, but but. I qualified it, it that that is also the flaring um the no the homo naledius is flare too that right and and according to um one author well discussing the homo there the one difference is that the the surface of the iliad in some are more uh in like in homo is flat in the hobbit it's more curved and it, it's also flared in the and in an andal specimen in a specimen of Homo habilis um, from the Simadilla Oasis site. The the pelvis is flared, but they have a concave uh, ilium, uh, more concave ilium. So it's hard, sometimes it's so it's hard to know actually the importance of that feature because because it, uh, you know whether whether the flaring alone is enough to say it was pathological. It's, it's hard to say, but 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 certainly. Um, yeah, they, but but it but they you know in, in diseases in modern humans uh, you don't well so when I say modern humans it's, yeah but generally speaking it it tends not to be as flared it, it tends to curve around the side more in, in modern humans and things like that but in some of the robust human it's a bit a uh, bit more flared in some but not all so it can be a bit of variation there as well and the variation may not be be due to pathology. Right. Since some of your Australopithecine specimens also have that flaring pelvis, could that also be due to pathology in an ape-like creature, or would you argue that that is just a normal trait? Or I, I, I think it's more. I think it's more normal. It's, it's the pattern you see. Okay. Um, I think. I think. I, I think most of them have that sort of flat. They have the flat. The flaring. The flatness and the orientation of blades are more kind of uh, coronally oriented or, or more forward facing. It doesn't curve around as much. Uh, where, whereas, uh, so so there's a little bit of a difference there, and a, and, a, and certainly a size difference between like a Neanderthal and a Australopithecine. And and so I think I think that relates to other. It also relates, yeah, to other features of anatomy about you know, um, and so. But it, yeah, it, look, it's a it's a complex thing. So yeah, one has right. to be one, one has to be careful. Uh, you know, but yeah, on, on, but the yeah, the anyhow, we'll, we'll probably get back to that when discuss Homo naledi. Yeah, I'm trying to refrain from asking questions related to Homo naledi. So I guess one or two final questions on Floresiensis. You have argued that essentially you'd have a parent population of robust humans like Erectus. And then a daughter population or a subpopulation broke off, became isolated on the island of Flores. And as a result, these pathological features manifested in, in that specific group rather than the entire erectus group, Peter. Yeah, well, well, it, well if erectus is, is found in Java, the main, the, there's no erectus fossils found in, uh, there, there are a lot of, stone tools and there's other there's other fossils found also small fossil small um specimens uh found on flores but there's no but there's no you know not there's no skulls like found on java like the, the nang don homo erectus or sanjian erectus mm. that are found on so 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 it may so it so i i believe some erectus must have gotten whether it's erectus or or, or it may well be denisovans because of 
Dennis Owens and the rectors may be the same. And there's there's right. various groups of Dennis Owens as well. It's not just one one group. There's the, 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 at least three of them. So basically, the, the and and so that they could have been um, yeah migrated to Florida. Some of them could have gone there. And and there's also you know, later later um, there's also you know more if you call them modern human populations there have come in as well and with it interbreeding and stuff so so there's there's a lot of complex interactions and and things like that and they, they have examined the, the DNA in, in the pygmy population because there's, there's a small pop uh, there's a population there right of, of pygmies are generally small in stature and I don't find any they say there's no trace of of any strange archaic data there's a trace of Denisovan and Neanderthal DNA but the thing is they, they don't know what the florist DNA or the, the sorry the hobbit DNA or Homo erectus DNA look like so it may well be that was Denisovan so that's right what, that's what I'm saying yeah don't so, they yeah. find on the island of Flores Peter other dwarf creatures like elephants yeah, that, that may well. Yeah, well, I think in the initial paper, yeah, there, there may be some stuff like that. Yeah, so so. Is, so is, is there something about? Effects. Is it something about these island conditions that result in this type of reductive evolution, for lack of better term? Well, yeah. Well, it, it, look, it's I, I don't I whatever it's some sort of epinet epigenetic effect in these animals you know so, you know that sort of come upon sort of starvation conditions i don't i don't know what whether that how that would apply to humans but certainly there's a some of them are small in size but i right. i don't really want to comment too much about it because because genetics isn't really my uh, uh kind of expertise of how that actually w would occur so I probably probably don't want to get too into too, too deep of waters about that but that that was a theory that they believe there was a island dwarfing and the basically erectus shrank and that that was it you know I don't, I don't know how plausible that is in terms of how genetics but the thing is I don't think that the, the skull would the skull wouldn't I don't think it in Hobbit it would it, you'd expect it to you know um brain size is is related to body size but certainly not in a, a modern human it wouldn't it the hobbit is not hasn't shrunk proportionally and I mean, even the home erectus hasn't shrunk proportionally so there's probably something else there going on even if it did shrink it probably you expect the 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 correct the, the skull to be a little bit larger so so to me it seems like what? something pathological is the possibility of a smaller brain size the result of selection favoring the smaller brain size in order to preserve energy and resources on an island where resources and food and so on are limited uh, peter what, what are your thoughts on that i i, I don't i don't really well you know I, I don't think it's a sort of selection thing and i i kind of i just i just i, th I think they you know, I don't. I don't think I'm not really that believe that much in that in a resource thing. I don't know how you'd, what why would get that small. To me, to me, to me, it's it does seem like pathological right. in in that it is small. It may, look, it may well have been functional. I don't know where, how mentally functional it was. Maybe initially in the reports, of, it was basically they were saying it had all these made all these tools and fires and stuff. And I think they're drawing it back a bit about the fires and other things. You know, so I don't. I know um you know so i don't know how mentally proficient it was it you know we just we just don't know but but we know that you know the brain map if, if you have a small body you don't need a large brain because you, uh, a lot of the areas of brain are, de are dedicated to you know getting information from receptors around the body and also from the, the you know the motor co cortex um the controllers or the muscles in the body so you may need less area for that with your smaller body and that you know that that's a lot well you know well i guess for the hobbit I, I guess for the hobbit ancestors to get onto the island in the first place could be evidence mm -hmm. of them being a sophisticated people group since wouldn't that be evidence of purposeful navigation in order to even I get to the def island? Def definitely I, I don't think they one of the problems they have is how did they, how did I get there? And it's, it's right. not just sort of falling on a raft and and you know uh, accidentally getting a raft and getting there. You don't you know 
there'd have to be lots of people and 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 the way the currents move and stuff like that it's all it's all you know it's not it may not be it's not as simple as it sounds and and things like that but yeah yeah it, it indicates that i had, had no navigate with watercraft and uh it, it's not as easy as it sounds and and so um so i cer certainly believe that the initial popular although the initial population likely may have been sort of erectus robust type humans or right. denisovans and um whatever happened I've, you know like i said the cretinism can reduce brain size considerably and if you already have a population with uh, erectus tend to have smaller brains then um that that could have happened or or or, or things like that um you know and yeah but but you know that you know i'm you know that yeah what some of what you're saying about you know whether there was some really adverse effect, environmental effect cause some sort of uh, selection for uh small brain uh, you know maybe maybe it's possible i don't know but i i think it i think the thing is you got you the problem is you need you need the genes there's so i don't think in, the waiting time problem you know that it is applies to creationists too so so i think only sort of that would have to be in an epigenetic sense where you don't have you know something like that uh, which is inbuilt into the genome something like that rather than uh yeah but I, I think your point peter on the <clears throat> purposeful navigation because I'll, I'll ask you this question then we can move on to the next part of your presentation there's so much yeah. good information here as usual peter i've heard some paleoanthropologists or students of paleoanthropology <laughs> argue that uh floresiensis was an astralopithecine that made mm. its way to the island but an astralopithecine yeah. we would all agree was not a sophisticated creature yeah. and so how would <laughs> it have to be yeah, an no, accident it, it, it doesn't work the thing is no astralopithecine or or some of those i don't believe i believe Hermobilus was essentially astralopithecine too right except for a couple of mixed in erectus specimens which are the sort of only partial skulls or whatever but but the thing is none none of those fossils have been found outside africa so that's a so that's a sort of uh, so that mm. so they'd be the first time and yeah they didn't they would have had ape like intelligence i i don't i don't, I don't believe they were, i don't classify them as apes because i think that they there were some differences i class i look at them as I, an extinct apish primate group a bit like you know monkeys are not classified as apes either so right. i put them in a separate category altogether but they would have been the so, similar intelligence to what we call apes and so i don't i don't see that how i could have they wouldn't have been able to build the watercraft or things like that and so it would have to be accidental but i but i think that that's uh yeah that's too i don't believe in too many coins big coincidences so i don't I, I don't think that's plausible at all and i think there's features in the, why why some are drawn back to draw erectus is there's features i found like i've uh, i haven't got the information in front of but there's certain features they found when examining whether it was a jaw or a skull but that indicate um links to some of the to, to erectus which couldn't have come from the australopithecine or something like that which means that uh it's kind of excludes the australopithecines so so i think there's other there's, there's morphological reasons as well for not you know in, you know the thing the thing is if you look at the jaw of the jaw of the hobbit is you know it's it's not it's not a strapiphacine like at all you know right it's it's, it's it more it's very you know it's much more human like and things it's gracile and things like that and and uh, the the face the face and things like that so it's not it's not a it's not a strapiphacine uh type skull and, and things like that, I so agree that with it's you. only it's only it's only its size basically and and some odd features that can be explained by pathology and things like that that well that, i think you made a good point that erectus already has a small brain hobbit yeah. has a smaller brain and so it wouldn't take much due to pathology and disease no. for an erectus brain to get a little bit smaller like we see in in hobbit and yeah. one final question actually peter based on your previous yeah. presentation part one again yeah. which was was comprehensive homo habilis you're arguing is essentially a waste basket tax on them mostly astralopithecine yeah. yeah. with some erectus bones mixed in yeah okay that's right okay peter well i think this was a, a good q a session if you'd like we can move on to 
the second well, part. I'll, I'll, I'll go to home room. and I'll let it in. I'll just, I'll just find it in the slide sort of where I start. So I'm just gonna and, and that's the more controversial one. Naledi, there's a lot of talk these days in the world of paleoanthropology yeah. with Lee Berger. That's, and so I think this should yeah, be that, that's pro probably it's the most controversial. Um, have, have you got the full screen there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that probably the most, this is probably the most controversial specimen I've come across and and it's probably one of the most difficult to sort. Uh, uh, and uh, the one one thing good about it is that the way they these guys do do their science paleoanthropology is they they kind of share their data a bit and make it available so I can show you can show slides at least at least if they've been published in places like eLife and stuff like that. And so and so you know what whilst you know of course, obviously I don't agree with their interpretation you know. I, I like, in a sense, I like the way they do the science of open access, and they make it interesting for people as well. So, so my so my disagreement with them is not personal, uh, but it's you know, is I have a different worldview, but but I like but I like the way they share data and things like that. But anyhow, so but I'll I'll start the presentation, okay? And and before I start, I'll just say I this is a working hypothesis. You know, I don't claim to have know all information. It may well turn out to be wrong. There may be some other explanation, and I hope it encourages people to look at it. You know, to to look at the data and, and see. And and there's a lot of data there, and I I haven't been able to, you know, look for everybody, look for everything. This is just a, a sample a sample of some of the data, some of the main things that are things, but there may be other things there that certainly I have mixed. But anyhow, so on Thursday, 10th of September. Uh, 2015, paleontologist Lee Berger from Wits University, South Africa, along with a team of international scientists, they announced the discovery of the new species, Homo naledi. And, and I write there, I find that brought even more perplexity to fields still reeling from trying to make sense of other finds, such as the Dominici Homo erectus fossil collection, particularly Skull 5, and also, as I've just talked about, Homo floresiensis. And I had not anticipated such a puzzling find. Uh, be honest, um, and so the announcement of the new species was, rep was represented by at least fifteen individuals based on a collection of fifteen hundred and fifty fossil male elements, and it was published in the journal eLife. Now, bear in mind that a lot of the stuff here, when you look at things, the thing is, um, the is fifteen individual, and, and a lot of stuff are commingled. You don't know where to you don't, some associated some bones are not associated so so things so features in one thing may not be you may be looking at different individuals but you don't know so that's this is the problem this is the thing with it and and as a and so i look at it could it could it be explained by cretinism and, and cretinism only affect if it's an affected area only um basically uh affects a small percentage of the population but you could be possibly sheltered together uh, as a group um you know common ground or whatever for whatever reason so there's a lot of things that we, and, and there's a new lot of we don't know how long did i time i spent in the cave a lot of recent finding indicates basically we'll, we'll get to that, that they use, seem now they who have occupied the cave seem to use fire a lot even cooking they seem to even be a hearth there and cooking and things like that food there so they may have spent a lot more uh, time in the cave than we first uh, thought. Uh, what we should first when it, when it was initially published. Anyhow, uh, so they described the morphology of these fossils, and also a companion paper, Dirks, described the physical context of the dinoleti chamber within the rising star system where the fossils are found. Um, and were, and at the time, there's certainly a lot of mystery surrounding how. How did the fossil material go into get into the Dinoleti chamber with occupation, predator accumulation, the water transport hypotheses uh, generally ruled out, but mass mortality or death trap and deliberate body disposal scenarios were considered plausible, and the latter explanation explanation was preferred by the authors. And that was at the time. Now there may be more information now has come out, you know, but that was at the time of publishing. Um, and 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 you can see here that there's a sort of anatomical mosaic, and and they describe the the skeleton as this 
This anatomic mosaic is reflected in different regional skeletons. So the morphology of the cranium mandible, as it, the jaw and dentition, is mostly consists of the genus Homo. Although when people say genus Homo, to me that's that doesn't tell me much because it, Homo includes Homo habilis, which I regard as mostly Australopithecine. So so that doesn't really. But but if they mean you know Homo erectus and Homo sapiens and stuff then then uh, it's more informative but anyhow but the brain and size of hominal is in the range of australopithecus so the lower limb is largely homo-like and the foot and ankle are particularly human in their configuration but the pelvis appears to be flared markedly like that of afarensis the wrist fingertips and portion of the fingers are shared mainly with homo but the proximal and intermediate manual family is markedly curved even to a greater degree than in any australopithecus. The shoulders are configured largely like those of australopiths. The word are most similar to the Pleistocene members of the genus Homo. Um, so that we have spirit case wide distally like Atherensis. So, so there's a lot of things there. So we're going to try and look at some of the things. Um, and I, was, I note that when studying this phone, you should remember that, that, that the analysis is based on multiple individuals, as is a skeleton, and in the next slide I'll, I'll show. It's a composite fossil. It's a composite skeleton, uh, which represent multiple individuals. Um, it's also based on the assumption that the fossil material represents a single species and not a commingled assemblage. And given the location of finds, this assumption is probably valid. I think it is still valid. Um, okay, this shows you some of the, um, the fossils that were found that were initially published, um, and so. Um, this figure includes all, approximately all of the material incorporated in, in, in the diagnosis, including the holotype specimen, paratypes, and referred material. It makes up about 737 partial or complete anatomical elements. The skeleton layout in the center of the photos are composite elements that represent multiple individuals. So you have to bear that in mind. You know, you're not looking at the same when you're not analyzing this. It's not the same skeleton with different parts, different individuals. You don't know. So you don't. So you don't know. So uh, so, yeah, so, so it makes it a little bit. Good. Now, I indicated before, the blue arrow indicates the location of, the, of a narrow goiter belt stretching for 300 miles across Transvaal from the sea rest and west through what Wit is sand around as far as Nelspruit in the east. Okay, so this belt is in the vicinity of the cradle humankind era of South Africa, where the rising star of Cave is located. So, this down the bottom, you can see that circle with X in it. That's where the um, Cradle of humankind in South Africa area is located. So I try to bring them up. You can see it it it, it sort of um comparing to and if I put a Google map, you can see that the triangles indicate some of the places that they say were goiter areas. Okay. And then the body can see the cradle of humankind area. So if it's not in the belt, it's very close to the belt. Okay. So in the past, um there was a problem with goiter there. And as we talked about, if there's a heavy infestation infestation of, or, or, or pronounced if goiter in a region, that a certain, it may be expected that you get a certain percentage of population may have cretinism. Yeah. <clears throat> this just shows you the cradle of humankind. It shows you where the rising star cave system is located. Okay. Uh, it's sort of... Um, a few kilometers away for Sturkfontein. Uh, Swartkrans is about 800 meters from the rising star uh, system, which uh, I mentioned that because we'll mention a fossil that later. Okay, so the holotype specimen is, as I presume, Malcol, Dinaledi, Hominin 1, DH1, and it's kind of shown here. Um, and uh, composed of partial calvaria, partial maxilla, and nearly complete mandible. Okay. And its cranial capacity is estimated at 560 cubic centimeters. All right. So um, the you can see the the mandible there. It's not. It's, I've typically have a U-shaped um, mandible. Uh, so dental arcade. It's a dental arcade in the mandible. It's generally U-shaped. That is more parabolic there. Um, I'm not sure whether, yeah, whether there's any deformation in it, but it generally looks um, more parabolic there. Now, and so 
when I published Stringer, I had an accompanying Chris Stringer, probably most people would have heard of him. He's a uh, prominent paleoanthropologist, evolutionist. So he had an accompanying uh, article in eLife and he labeled it as having a relatively high and thin skull and small teeth. He said, overall to my eye, the material looks most similar to small body examples of Homo erectus from Damanese, Georgia, which have been dated at about 1.8 million years old. And the Berger paper stated that compared to samples Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo erectus, the teeth and Homo are comparable, are comparatively quite small, similar in dimensions to much later samples of Homo. So that would be more, I guess, much later samples of Homo. So that would be things that Hylomagensis erectus or or sapiens. Uh, well, it, it, it'd be in that grouping um, because Homo habilis. Um, existed only in their timeline that was in uh, earlier earlier would have been earlier homo having small teeth uh, having small teeth is a feature of modern humans as is having a high and thin skull the cranial vault of homo naledius described by burger as having only slight post orbital constriction the mandibular dental arcade is parabolic as, as parabolic in shape and the mandibular body as being relatively gracile these features of the skull do not align with the distrial epiphysis, but rather indicates that it's a human skull, although, albeit not an anatomically modern human skull. So in, and in the National Geographic, the general shape of the skull of the composite male homonology skull is said to have been advanced uh, and it was labelled as a humanesque uh, skull. Now, when asked whether homonology could be considered as a new species without dating palanthropologist Tim Wright responded, and I uh, I probably have to uh, say that, in fairness, Tim Wright is probably not a big fan of Lee Berger, so bear that in mind. But anyhow, he said dating is irrelevant. These are a small primitive Homo erectus, whatever the date turns out to be. This is because they're not bio biological different in any significant way from already known Homo erectus found in places like Swartkrantz, 800 metres away in Eastern Africa or the Georgian Republic. In other words, as it says about the newly described species, it's an example of artificial species inflation in paleoanthropology. Now, regardless of whether it's classified as Homo erectus or not, the form of the skull appears to be within human variation. Here, human variation encompasses a combined range of both modern and robust humans. And robust humans, that's something what I call robust humans, are cruise the range of broadly defined Neanderthals, Hylobagensis, and Erectus. However, it does have a very small cranial capacity. Now, the the skull that um, Tim White was referring to in Swartkrans, which is a um, about 800 meters away, is is very likely SK847 cranium, um, and that's been affiliated both Homo erectus and Homo habilis. Um, it, it, it's mainly just the face that is preserved part part of the face. It likely had a very small cranial capacity. So data, alleged data have been about one and a half to two million years ago. And Ronald Clark, who's actually the one that also discovered Lufo, he stated in, in 1995 that they were kind of say whether 80, A47 had a brain size like that of Homo habilis or early Homo erectus. Um, the erectus like morphology of the frontal bone, which is not seen in any of the Homo habilis cranium, plus a remarkable overall similarity to 3733 convinces me that 847 must now be classified as an early Homo erectus. Just take a drink. This shows the 373 cranium from uh, QB4 Kenya, discovered in 95, cranium capacity 848 cubic centimeters, allegedly dated about 1.78 million years ago. And that's shown, it probably doesn't tell you much because maybe not, they're not quite the same angle. And they're not all past are preserved. And uh, it, the best comparison, if you look on the side view of it, um, you can see it, see they're very similar. But I, I don't have a picture of that that I can show actually. Um, so, um, um, but that's that's the comparison there. Now, more recently, there's also been um, because we're talking about Hamerectus in that region. There's been another. In, in 2015 and reported in 2020, there was another erector skull found, or a classified Homo erectus, a juvenile one called DNH 134, that I affiliated with Homo erectus. 
dated to, to close to, to around two million years ago, allegedly. Um, and it, and it, and according to the author Herius et al, it, it re represents the oldest fossil of Finnish Homo erectus in the world. And it's said to have an estimated chronicaspy of 500, 538 cubic centimetres. But because there's a dune lava, they estimate age about two and three years. And so if you use a, a model that it's a human, um, basically, uh, then it, they estimate it would reach an adult cranial capacity between 588 and 661 cubic centimetres, according to the human model. So already in the area, not in the rising star system, but all, um, the Jamolan is about um, probably more six, seven or so, or eight, something like that kilometres away from rising star. But it's in it's in this area. So already you have specimens that seem likely to be Homo erectus with small brain capacities in the in the general area already. Okay, now forget about the dates. Um, uh, but I don't accept the dates, but, but you see, I have these, these specimens already in the area. And while we're on small erectus cranial capacity, I, I just mentioned this other one too, the, which is the, the smallest adult erectus cranium known from Africa. And that was um, discovered uh, in, in 2000, but it was only reported back in... Uh, What's the size? What's the date of the size? In 2020. Okay. So that's the an adult cranium Dan 5 P1 from Ghana, far Ethiopia. So that's dated about, allegedly dated to about 1.6 to 1.5 million years ago. And that, a cranium has to be at 588 cubic centimeters. And that's classified as Homo erectus and um, the smallest erectus cranium known crania from Africa. Okay. Um, Um, and that interesting of that is that here we report uh, it was found in direct association, not just mode one tools, but mode two tools. So that's the Achillean sort of hand axis and stuff like that. And so usually that that the, while whilst the older one tools, you know, you know, monkeys can bashing rocks can un unintentionally produce older one type tools. The, the hand axis, the Achillean tools, my two tools, that would that that would that would have to be delivery designed, and that indicates human activity. So this likely was human. It was just, uh, so so it's human. So either it made it or someone else in the in, in the population made these tools. Um, and and even as I mentioned last time, uh, I talked about Daniel Lyon, um, who had a cranial capacity in the um, the mid to high 600 cubic centimeters it was a normal human with normal intelligence okay a, a modern human with normal intelligence in that range so you can't say that so, so theoretically this person could, could have been normal intelligent doesn't doesn't so the brain size doesn't necessarily the cranial because it's got a small brain doesn't necessarily mean it is pathological or it, it wasn't, or it was unintelligent. Okay, so I just I just uh, wanted to to basically state that, and and particularly in Homo erectus, it does seem to be a preponderance of uh, erectus um, specimens with smaller cranial capacities. I don't, I'm not sure why, but um, just from observation, although there are ones erectus type specimens, whether they classify or not, that have much lighter cranial capacities, and so I talk about that more in when it does this come erectus. But there are erectus of cranial like Su Chang from China, a cranial capacity eighteen hundred cubic centimeters, and and there's others too. A very robust, very robust cranium, not classified um, as as erectus uh, that have large cranial capacities. Anyhow. Anyhow, so, so here we get to the Amanoli scale. So that, that's the composite scale that was um, that was presented to the world at the time. And um, so basically, you get the white, I'm just showing the white parts there because the, the kind of the mid-face region was kind of missing. So I have my own cast of it here, but I just show, wanted to show that because of what's missing and then i have this is the um 
couple of years later, this, this the uh, actually not a composite, but a cast of an adult individual skull was uh, published. And that's from uh, the Lissetti chamber of the Rising Star System. And that, this, this uh, the LES1 skeleton, also nicknamed Neo. And, and so basically uh, that um, had a cranial capacity estimated about 610 cubic centimetres. So that's within the kind of erectus range of the other erectus specimens in the area and also the one in Ethiopia. Um, okay, so um, just, just thought I'd show it there now. So you can see the comparison there. Now, you notice the mid-face region that is missing for the composite one. You can see there it, its mid-face seems to be a lot shorter. So that I guess they didn't have the information there. The, the other one, it looks a lot more prognathic. If you look at the, um, in the paper where they publish it, it shows the, the, you can see there, um, the, the the skull. Now, what's interesting, you can see where the, the maxilla bone join, joins the nasal bone. It's that's the only real part that the the sort of the, the bottom or the mid face downwards is, is actually connecting with the other parts of the skull. So I don't know how much, how so so you could where do you where do you tip it a bit and that changes the uh, the mid-face prognathism uh, or, or how it projects forward, it, it, it could change. It could change the angle a bit. Um, I don't know. So that's that's just an observation. Now, so you so in addition, so a couple of years later, they published on um, the LSE one skeleton um, and. Um, it, it and um, most of the and I noticed that most of the adult postcranial material probably belongs to the same individual. The adult cranial and postcranial main is shown here. They stay. So the possibility that the femora represent two adult individuals makes it unclear which femur may be attributable to the skeleton. So they only showed basically the the left femur there, but what's preserved of it. And this this is sort of I guess a little bit interesting because according to a Huxagal, the two femoral fragments are different in muscle attachment and diaphyseal morphology to the extent that we represent unusual asymmetry in a single individual. And it's the inference of two adults. So, so they're suggesting that was it there was two adults in there, but it was it was but but the was based on the the morphological incongruence of these left and right femoral elements, as there was no adult element, there's no adult element. Was was is they say it is clearly duplicated in the collection. So basically, you, you have this adult skeleton found there has a left and right femur. There's no duplicate elements, but because the right femur, if if, if it was combined, it would have to be such an unusual, uh, um, basically um, a symmetry for a single individual that I that I have to that I propose that it, there must have been a second individual there. On the other hand, does that indicate even in this one? Which is a little bit more robust than the others. Is is this some sort of indicates some sort of abnormality in the in the skeleton? Any other? Now, the at the um, the dating of when it was initially published, the, there was no date for the uh, Amanaletti uh, material. But in in basically they uh, in two thousand seventeen when when they published the the material from the Lissetti chamber to also publish a date and and basically uh, using different methods. And so by combining the uranium series electrospin resonance ma maximum age estimate obtained from TIP if the uranium form age of the oldest flow stone overlying hominidal falls fossils, I say we have constrained the fossil age of hominidal to a period between 236 and 330,000 years ago. Um, what's interesting is that three wedded Home and lady bone fraction, fragments were radiocarbon dated, providing ages of 33,000 and 35,000 years or, or dated to that time ago. The age of the third sample is not given. And they say that tests did not support cremation, indicated extensive secondary um, a calcium uh, carbonate uh, replacement uh, had occurred, providing uh, um, or calcite. 
um, had occurred, providing ages of 33 and 35,000 for two of the fragments. We interpret these ages to relate to late calcite precipitation in the bones that may reflect the wet period in the cave. So these ages are, are these ages are considerably younger than what the researchers considered the most parsimonious age estimate for the Naledi fossil for the for the Homo Naledi fossils, which is something between two thirty six and three hundred thirty five thousand years ago, allegedly. Now, this description of age results between different methods does little to dispel concerns that the dates obtained all depend on which radiometric me method you use to assess the fossil's age. Now, prior to obtaining an age, Hawks and Berkeley considered Homo naledi more primitive than Homo erectus. So they stated, we maintain that homology of Homo naledi places it in a position primitive of Homo erectus. And if we accept this position, then Homo naledi lineage must have existed earlier than the first occurrence of Homo erectus around 1.8 million years ago. They also state the most disruptive scenario of three possibilities, in my opinion, is a recent date for the Denaledi hominins. This scenario requires a long survival of Homo naledi alongside other species of Homo and Australopithecus, possibly into the late Pleistocene or even Holocene. Such a scenario would further complicate our ability to associate material cultures with specific hominin species and would question the ability of many attributions attribution of known hominin fossil remains. So that so even though it was two to three hundred thousand years ago, that was relatively late in evolution terms. So I don't know whether that's the most disruptive scenario, but but it probably isn't the scenario they they may have wanted for the fossils because because it it has become uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, a sort of difficult. It, it doesn't fit. It doesn't actually fit any scenario really. Um, so basically. It, it, and I've got here, it seemingly sidelined and led it to being a more curiosity on, on the evolution storyline. Story Amazing, one prominent paleontologist, Bernard Wood, um, he is he, quoted as, uh, as saying that he thinks Homo naledi branched off from other humans relatively recently and then evolved to look more primitive. Its primitive, primitive features might be misleading, he says. Um, so it goes up, for instance, Southern, Af Southern Africa may have been relatively isolated from the rest of the continent, says Wood. Lack of competition from other humans could have relaxed the pressure on having ready to grow a, a large brain. If the skeleton no longer had to be the weight of a heavy skull, features like the hips and shoulders might have reverted to become more like those of a small brained hominin. Uh, so that's so, and so I got so, such mental gymnastics highlight that rather than being an example of eight man transition, Naledi, it's a peculiar mix of features as puzzling to evolution as the primitive features of Homo naledi, rather than be explained by evolutionary reversals, are more plausibly explained by pathology or pathologies perhaps involving cretinism. So this, so this, so if you think that and naledi supports evolution, well, you just got to look at what prominent evolutionists like Bernard Wood is saying. But basically, it doesn't. They don't have to have it reversal. It's it's actually evolving to be from more modern. It's evolving to be more primitive. Okay, so you know, uh, so the, the and the problem is that, you, and the, the problem with any evolution is is one is the waiting time problem to get all these mutations to come back in. So it's so now that you have to get mutations to make it more primitive again. So how long does this take? It's all, you know, and and yeah, it's it's an impossible scenario. Um, yes, just have another drink. So here, here you can see the home now lady foot, um, or foot one. So basically, uh, that's the sort of so that they're kind of found in association, okay? So that's the foot one, the uh, dorsal view, superior view from the top, and then you have the side view, uh, on, on the on the bottom, it's, it's a medial view. So, so basically, the the toe, the big toe, would is closest to the screen. Uh, now, in the, in the initial paper, in the earlier paper, they, the Berger team stated the foot and ankle are particularly human in the configuration. Essentially, the only traits of its foot, regarded as primitive, was evidence suggesting of a lower arch foot, flatter feet, with a more plantarly position, a horizontally inclined medial palm than typically found in modern humans. Although, although even this is now, even the flat foot, uh, as I'll discuss, a, a study shows that it probably wasn't, didn't even have flat foot. So, so that's one less thing. Uh, now, in a, 
Palantos will, will Harcourt Smith lead author on a publication. I haven't know the foot stated that it is essentially the foot of a modern human, but subtly different. Uh, and so, but even if it uh, even if it does have flat foot, which now it's in doubt, or, or slight not slightly flat foot, that's a frequently encountered pathology in, in pediatric and adult human populations. So, and it's not regarded as a primitive condition in modern humans. So it's probably it's possible present in the foot of hominality is probably not that significant. Okay, that's just a diagram of the foot in case I need to refer to it. Um, so Harcourt Smith in, in their public publication on the hominality foot stated, it's predominantly modern human-like in morphology and third function of an adducted hallux. That means that the big toe is in line with the other toes. It's not opposable like in apes, okay? And elongated tarsals, the seven bones that form the ankle joint and derived ankle and calcinocubit joints. In combination, these indicate a foot well adapted for striding bipedalism. However, the early foot differs from modern humans having a more curved proximal pedal fang phalanges, that is the toes, and features suggest they were reduced medial longitude and large. So now the, the range of curve and the, the pedal proximal phalanges, the toe bones, appear to elap, uh, looking at the data, they, they actually elap considerably with Homo sapien. So I don't think this finding is really that significant. It's interesting, uh, well, I think I've got it here. Um, it's interesting that the toe bones of the LB1 Homo floresiensis are also said to be slightly curved. That is its proximal uh, pedal phalanges, and it had, and that it had an absent or reduced medial longitude arch in its foot. Um, so, according to Jungers et al., the metatarsus has a human-like robusticity formula, but the proximal pedal phalanges are relatively long and robust and slightly curved. The hallux is fully adducted, that is in line with the other toes, so so not opposed, uh, basically not opposable like an ace. But we suspect that a medial longitudinal arch was absent. Okay, and, and as I already talked, Homo floresiensis is possibly associated with, say, with, with cretinism. On the Nelly foot, paranthropologist Dan Lehman is quoted saying, the foot is indeed strikingly modern and suggests it walked and possibly ran much like modern humans. And I was alluding to this study earlier by Lee et al. Um, they had as a major goal to test the hypothesis that, that Homo Nelly did not have a flat foot as it is widely considered by prominent researchers. And from the study, the authors reported uh, this uh, obtained results strongly suggest that hominidity does not have a flat foot. Um, and the relative wide forefoot foot and narrow counselors reveal that hominidity is skilled in running with forefoot striking the ground, a, pat a better pattern for barefoot running because the ankle will be less likely to sprain. Running with forefoot striking can benefit from proprioception as well as the shock absorption function of longitudinal foot arch. So basically, one of the striking features is that it's essentially a modern foot and and so you know um now that so that's a very strong indication along with the skull that it, you're dealing with, with a human here you know now based on the uh, on a tibia the stat the estimated stature of one home and linear individual was estimated to be between 145, 144.5 and 147.8. Uh, um, the statute, I must have got, got uh, I must have got that probably, um, must be centimeters, not millimeters. Where, whereas um, body mass was estimated from eight female specimens to vary from 39, 39 point, uh, um, seven kilograms and 50 right point, 55.8 kilograms but then that that's that doesn't include every every specimen all, all individuals that just certain certain specimens um so that so their their estimates of both stature and body mass that they're, they're, they're comparative with small body humans so they were generally small in size um now it stated that locomotive traits shared with homo include the absolutely long lower limb so so generally humans have um um, when I say humans, I don't include the Homo villus specimens. That they have actually absolutely long, longer lower limb uh, with male male near spiria, strong M gluteus maximus assertions, and graceful fibula, and generally human-like ankle and foot. These aspects of the lower limb suggest enhanced locomotive performance for a striding gait. Um, 
And and in the name. In, the, the National Geographic article by James Shrew uh, shows that uh, in a compass skeleton, skeleton illustrates Homer and Aledi with long legs. Um, okay, so now, so let's look at so, some of the part, other parts of the, the the skeleton. So look at the pelvis. So in the um, uh, Van Sickle et al. examined the pelvis. Uh, Publication a few years after the initial discovery. And I say that the degree of lateral fear of Herman Leder Ilium resembles that of Africanus. So there's at least several Africanus specimens that are at least attributed to Africanus and Afarensis. Um, and, and she says, note that the the KSD, the Kanamu or Big Man skeleton, that, that's a skeleton attributed to Afarensis, but there's no really elements that actually diagnostic elements because they're missing. It's hands, feet, and, and skull. Um, a post granule skull without taxonomically diagnostic cranial dental material that has been attributed to Afarensis may have had a more hu modern human-like orientation of the Ulek Allah, which is a larger expanded portion of the Ulek. So that's what gets back to my, my, I don't know how much I covered it in the last time, I'm saying that's an Afarensis specimen dated about 3.6 million years ago, allegedly, but it's very modern. It has a very much human-like, uh, a lot of the features are very human-like, and it don't, I don't believe it belongs in Afarensis at all. But but I don't evolutionists can't call it that, that or erectus because that that would catastrophically affect their timeline. Anyhow, one fe feature now uh, you can see the the lateral il iliac flare. You can see in in B. Uh, if, if you see that, that's basically um, anterior view. So basically, it's kind of like the the hip is here, so the ilia is flaring out there. And the, the one thing, um, I don't know if I have a, okay. So, but the, note, the one thing noted, it, it, it's, it's very flat and basically it flares out to the side. So that, so it has a, so it resembles that of Africanus, at least superficial afarensis um, in that specimen. You know, although, like I said, that it's only one specimen. So I don't, I don't, not sure how many, um, you know, other specimens. Uh, I don't know that. I can't, I'm not quite sure how many. Um, uh, when I put it together, how many actual specimens? Uh, whether I give the same value or how many specimens I've actually got that they can give it that they can actually uh, quantify as, as flaring or whatever. So, but that's just one specimen. Um, I think in the next slide I'll talk more about it. The, but the other thing is, uh, which I talked about last time, was the the um, the body or, or centrum of the, the the sacrum, the first the first S1 body, the top of the sacrum. It's shown in C and D. D shows the top of it, and it, it says it, it has the small. In terms of the body, the area it has the smallest yet recorded in, in the adult hominin fossil record, comparatively about smaller than that of the SGS14 Africanus. Okay. And and basically, uh, and falling close to sea mangs, that is black furred gibbons. Okay, so basically, and, and it's and basically it's ver and also I don't know where they were saying, but we can get to the vertebrae. There's some really small vertebrae. The, the spinal canals are more normal, but their their bodies are very very small. And this one is really small. And I mentioned then that it, it, with Afarensis, which is large, which has a larger body, even evolutionists uh, have doubts about whether it it it, it could support sort of the the, the stress and strain of a, a continued upright posture and walking and stuff like that um, with such a small um, cross section area or body of the centrum. Now this is even smaller still, and so if it's human, then it it's strange and the one thing that might explain it is cretinism as can have severe dwarfism so you know so lucy was the 1.05 meters and lucius was larger so this could represent a really a very a dwarfed individual i mean cretinism cretin can be under a meter in height so that's a possible explanation so that would be in line with the cretinous explanation why you have such a small um vertebra uh Okay. Now this now like I said, I don't know how many actual vertebrate are 
and stuff like that. So that so the mate, you know, the the ones in the Leslie chamber that they found some there are a bit more robust and things like that. Um, but this is very small. So that so this that could in very well indicate the folly. I don't know how you it, even a you know a, a human is usually a modern human well to see is, is much larger as i showed an example of uh, so this is one indicator that would possibly do some form of a very small individual in fact they acknowledge that with the vertebra um as i'll show later on and so this but this could be indicating a some form of dwarf not just a small individual but this is a abnormal normally small uh okay so so basically the the um the ilium the flaring of the ilium is, is similar said to be similar to our forensis um at least in this feature um and basically uh the flare of the ilium and um basically um uh, the the they note that the angle i can measure the angle because the electrosa is flat instead of concave so i mentioned so if you read the, if you look at the bottom there they mention that they look at some of where some other specimens which the flaring of that and say and i say that the, the naledi flimna ilio are more flared than sediba and specimen attributed to early homo so this is three kmr three two two eight oh h28 km 15000 um so basically um 15 pounds that's the Takana boy okay and so and that's how they're similar to leg flaring in later homo specimens that sh palace one that's homo hydro against it that, that that's a human lb17 that's the homo floresiensis the cabara too so that's a neanderthal so so we've got these three as humans so that has similar lateral alien flaring uh, as in the lady well I, well, I'm not sure what the angle is the same, but it says where is it? It remained flat in the Leti and the early Australopiths. That is, the former curvature is also present in modern humans. Uh, so it's basically saying that, sorry, the the ilia is concave, but flared in the specimen, the, the Hardwigensis, Hobbit, and Cabarrus specimen, where it is in the Leti and the early Australopithecus, it is flared but flat. Okay, now the former um now the concave uh ilic fossa is also present in modern humans and and modern humans lack the flaring of these late homo what they call late homo fossils. And and they state we suggest that Homo and Lily had more primitive iliac anatomy but flared but flat than either early homo, which is not very fair. So basically some of the early homo was less flared than some of the later ones. It's, it seems a bit contradictory. And later home are flared but curved or modern humans not flared. So so it's a sort of bit of a dog's breakfast working this one out because it, you know you know the 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 where the one diff the one thing it so flaring may not necessarily indicate pathology if if you actually see it in Neanderthals and Homo begins I guess one of the indication is that um it was flat, the the iliac surface was flat, not curved okay and just just for the record i don't know if i got it um the lateral flaring of ilium is is present also in cretinism okay now and so basically an and the hobbit specimen is it um is described as having marked degree of lateral ilium flaring it recalls that scene in australopithecine such as lucy so they so the people looked at the Hobbit compared its pelvis flaring to Lucy. I don't look, know if they looked at the curving and how much, what the extent of curving is or not. But so that's the state of play with the sort of the um, the pelvis. Okay, now the vertebra. Let's just have another sip. Now in in the initial burger paper that the description of the vertebra was consistent of homo lady being human they said that the preserved adult uh, thoracic 10 and 11 vertebra are proportionally similar to pleistocene homo with transfer process morphology most similar to neanderthals the neural canals of these vertebra are large in comparison to the diminutive overall size of the vertebra proportionally recalling Donese directors neanderthals and modern humans 
and then then so, so they basically uh basically saying they um uh, that the 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 turn in the new york has a large in the in the later um paper by hawks that i'll stated that uh on the on the Donati, the sorry on on the um findings in the lesetti chamber uh it states that the the, the Nunnally chamber and lesetti chamber two fossil litter repairs thoracic 10 and 11 vertebra were comparable in size, but the, the Lissetti vertebra clearly belonged to a larger, more robust, presumed male individual. So again, there is, there's a, there's a very, like, there is a lot of variability in, in these things. Now, further analysis of the Nadi chamber vertebra remains was recorded in, in 2017. So just the early ones. And so here I say, here, by Williams et al. And here, so here we describe hominin vertebra ribs and sternal veins from the Nadi chamber uh, okay, tribute to Lady and says, although the ranges are, are highly fragmented, the, the best preserved specimens, two lower thoracic vertebrae and a lower rib, were found in association and belong to a small bodied individual. A second lower rib may belong to this individual as well. So, this is associated um, finds so, or, 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 or fossil um, specific fossils. All four of these individual elements are amongst the smallest known in the hominin fossil record. So basically, again, this sort of goes back to what I was saying about the this, the, the small uh, centrum of a body of the sac first sacrum being the smallest in the fossil record. Here now they're saying this is the smallest known um, vertebra in the in the uh, fossil record. So again, in a the they're calling it a, a small bodied individual. So again, this this suggests to me it could very be some some sort of dwarfism as, and which would be consistent with uh, extreme forms of cretinism or something like that. As I say, how these characters by robust relative uncurved low ribs and a relatively large spinal canal. So they still have a large, relatively large spinal canal, but the the vertebra are very um, the body are very small. Now the the initial Berger pa paper on the rib cage uh, just described the rib cage as wide distally like afferensis, and elsewhere in the paper they stated, uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to avoid reading all of it. Um, the shape of the upper rib cage appears narrow, as assessed from first and second rib fragment, suggesting that the forex is pyramidal in shape. The twelfth rib presents a robust shaft cross section most similar to Neanderthals. This combination not found in other hominins that might reflect allometric scaling at a small trunk side. Now, in the team's follow up paper on the vertebrae and ribs on homoerotic by Williams et al., this, as so we speculate that apparent lack of rib torsion as hominins does suggest a wide lower thorax morphology, perhaps coupled with a crony converted upper thorax that is dissimilar to that of modern humans and perhaps Neanderthals and other members of the junior homin, homo. I say the proximal upper rib ends in ends in humility are too incomplete to allow reconstruction of the curve to have a, a strong cranially oriented glenoid and an ele elevated clavicle and shoulder are suggested of a narrow upper forex. Now now the the um the Homo erectus um Narcan boy is described as having a barrel shaped forex. Uh, I can show you there. You can see there that's a modern human there i'll just go back to the slide now the, the reconstructed rib cage of afferensis the lucy specimen described as being shaped like a funnel with narrow part at the top and wide lower region you can see it here on the left here so it's more wider and, and narrow at the top and you can see the neanderthal is like kind of re it was thought to be barrel shaped now it's sort of more wide distally but, but maybe not as as much as the uh um uh, as after as afferences um so and, and as it's indicated that before 2001 the neanderthal rib cage illustrated text would look like a barrel shaped human model but they in 2001 they assembled an entire neanderthal skeleton um consisting of fossil areas from different sites and it boasted a conical shaped four four axis tap it upward from the broad pelvis to a narrow top giving it uncredit an incredibly distinctive look. Hence, a wide distal lower region, lower region rib, cage, rib cage can, apart from being interpreted to be like 
afarensis also perhaps be interpreted as being similar to that of neonatals. Now, um, so let's have another sip. Now, simply suggesting that that four axis pyramidal shape sounds unconvincing, but what if it does turn out to be pyramidal shape? As suggested, apart from re re resembling an Australopithecine and possibly Neander, what other explanation is possible? Now, a paper by Ordinary and what showed a photo illustrating a case of hyperthyroidism and cretinism in the thorax part of the skeleton of an 80 year old modern human male. In the caption, it says, No triangular shape of thorax, indicating greatly diminished development of costa of cranial end of thorax relative to lower costa. Now, I don't have a, a, a photo, I don't have that picture to show. Now, I don't know if you can see, can you see this paper at all, uh, Donnie? You there? Yes, let me. Uh, can you see that? No, if, yes, if you go to, now we can. Skeletal, skeletal manifestation of hyperthyroidism uh, from Switzerland, American Journal of Physica, uh, Physical Anthropology, 2005, uh, volume 127. Now, if you go to page five, it's so if you have access to this page, go to page five. I don't know if can you can you see on can you see on top here? Yes, I put you full screen so we right, can see so it good. That's what I'm talking about. The the pyramidal shape that's a that's a human cretinism and you can see that the uh, shape of the um rib cage or thorax how it's it's you know it's, right. it's more um loosey like the loosey okay it's it's um triangular shaped okay so anyway, that's what i'm talking about and in fact the the uh, order notes show that in, in they examined 12 cases of, of skeletal growth disturbance in hyperthyroidism Hyperthyroidism. So in the 12 cases, eight cases had disproportionate development of the root cage. So, so you don't get this, in fact, in all people with cretinism, but in, in a high proportion. And the author stated disproportionate development of the cost are typically of the cost are typically more severe in the cranial end of the thorax. So 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 um so basically a pyramidal triangle of thorax and hominoid, it could be evidence that one is dealing with a developmental pathology such as cretinism. Okay, and and that and that I'll talk when we'll talk later about the shoulder. That that could have a if there's a development link, that could have a knock out effect to what happens at the shoulder as well. We'll talk about that more later. Okay, so now so looking at the hand, so that the there's a paper on a hand by Kibble et al. Um, and they state that the wrist and palm are generally most similar to those of Nandrils and modern humans, while the fingers are more curved than some australopiths. Um, this distinctive mosaic of morphology has yet to be observed in any of the other any any other hominin taxon and suggests that the use of the of the hand for arboreal locomotion, combination, and forceful precision manipulation typically used during tool related behaviors. So at face value, the fingers are hominin appears better suited to climbing than chimpanzees. As the proximal phalanges, phalanges are about the same curvature, but homolytic intermediate phalanges are considerably more curved than those of chimpanzees and australopithecines. The median value is even higher than orangutans. According to the authors, extant apes and most fossils, some such as Afarensis and OH7, generally have most more strongly curved proximal phalanges and comparably straight intermediate phalanges. Here, and on the right there, you show it shows hand one, uh, a palm of you on the left, and dorsal view on the right of, of the hand uh, discovered in articulation. So, um, and it's a proportion of the digits are human like. Um, all right. Yet, other aspects of the hand, the thumb, wrist, and palm bones all look remarkably modern, uh, according to James Shreve in National Geographic. Hence, most of the homolytic hand is human-like, except for the markedly curved fingers. State as a clear functional indication that finger experience high loads during grasping required for climbing or suspensory locomotion. Now, it, studies do show that the curvature in, in the finger bones are generally the result of mechanical strain uh, put on them. Okay, so the more you, uh, so that's generally true. Um, 
So the Fulano curve is one of the best indicator function in the hand, the degree, according to according to authors of the hand, the degree of longitude curve is strongly correlated to give average locomotion across primates. So climbing, especially sensory taxa, showing much stronger curve than terrestrial quadrupedal or bipedal taxa. Is is an interesting data regarding Homo floresiensis that its proximal phalanx is curved similar to degree as an afarensis. So basically, um, Kivel is stating that. Uh, so that was the not the LB1 individual. Um, the fluorescensis bone referred to actually belonged to the LB6 individuals. And the author of that study say the LB6 eight falls at the extreme upper end of the human range and overlaps of gurus is similar to respect in this respect to, to uh, an Australopithecus afarensis spenso. So the proximal manual phalanges of the Homo fluorescensis of the of, of the LB1. Uh, specimens, uh, specimen, the phalanges that are too in, incomplete, appear too incomplete to make conclusive judgment of curvature. So no information appears to be given on the curvature of intermediate manual phalanges of LB1 and LB6 homo fluorescensis individuals. And so, um, and as I've said, they, they've been argued to, to be, be cretins and they have curvature, at least proximal phalangeal curvature is evident at least in one of the individuals. So there's a pattern there. So hence, did Homo leadenius suffer from cretinism in a similar way that individuals from Homo floresiensis species possibly did with the curved fingers related to cretinus or associated conditions? Now this is where, uh, you know, I, I don't know that cretinism explains this, but, but it, it, any as bone uh, pathology that weakens the bone would make you more susceptible to mechanical strain that you don't have to climb. So our example is essentially Mozart's fingers were extremely curved. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, quoting here from a, a book, The Bleeding of Mozart. Mozart's fingers were extremely curved and that this is possible due to bone deformity suggestive old heel rickets as apparently the lack of light and dietary condition of his infancy left little doubt that Mozart must have suffered from rickets or at least from vitamin D deficiency. So the thing is, I don't know whether cretinism can cause the weakness of the bones means it's more easier to the, the bones just bend easier because they're weaker but certainly if they have rickets or vitamin d deficiencies they do and that's also a weakness of the bones and so whether you have now a different uh, so now i don't know the the conditions of the, the lady sample you know did how much time did i spend in the case you know particularly the young where you know was that um like it, it, initially, it was thought they only buried the dead, but it seems like all the fires and stuff they made, they may have spent a considerable time in there. Uh, whether that was a refuge, a safe place of safety, I don't know. So, how much, what's you know, how much sunlight were they exposed to? What was their diet? Was it vitamin D deficient? So, th these are questions um, that, that that sort of it's hard to answer at, at present. How would the, 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 the lady's hand? Um, it doesn't make sense in an evolutionary scenario if it was transitional between Australopithecines and the latest species Homo, as indicated by finger curvature. Why would it spend as much time swinging in trees as as its hypothetical um, Australopithecine ancestor, ancestor, as indicated by its proximal phalanges? Or actually, more? Why would it be swinging in trees? much more than its ancestor, even more so than chimps and perhaps as much as orangutans if you consider only the intermediate phalanxes when it should be less so. You know, you have a, you have a, it had human legs, feet, so it wasn't really adapted for climbing trees, Not a, certainly not its lower body. And it, there's no way it would have been as good as the chimpanzees or orangutans. It wouldn't have been, you know, th that would not have been, so I just don't see how it's, how, it could possibly that the curvature could be that it spent so much time in the trees uh, that it, it particularly its intermediate phalanxes were so curved more than so than orangutans. Um, although it should point out there it, the variation curve is quite considerable um, now, and and uh, particularly the the, the uh, curvature on the intermediate phalanxes. So there's a lot of variation there as well. So this is one of the, one of the areas, but I just don't fit. It does it doesn't fit any evolutionary scenario. 
and it it just doesn't it just doesn't fit it so so um and but that is what one of the things i've deferred to look at when it well what, what can explain this this curvature um now this 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 is a, a an interesting thing looking at the humeral torsion and so it's it's the angle by which the orientation of the elbow axis deviates from that of the head of the upper arm bone so it's defined as the torsion so basically torsion of the head of the humerus is defined as the angle made by the axis of the head of the, the humerus here with the axis of the kind of elbow joint here now among the primates humans show the greatest degree of torsion followed by the african apes the orangutans the gibbons the, the semi-branching new world monkeys and then by the old world monkeys now, the high degree of human torsion has generally been considered as a feature shared by human as apes as a result of a common ancestral adaptation to either recreation or falling assisted climbing. Oh, and Larson has pointed out that most specialized brach, the most specialized brachiator, the gibbon, has a small degree of torsion in comparison to humans and the larger apes. Larson also suggested that the high degree of human torsion in humans and the African apes is most probably not a shared feature inherited from a common ancestor, but a feature that has been achieved in parallel in response to different selection pressures. So here, here's a here's sort of parallel evolution. You need now, now you need two miracles. You need the, you need the the gen, information in the genome to be uh, for this this um, humeral torsion to be imparted separately to explain something. The same author also argue that the equally high degree of human torsion in humans is a response not to like emotion but to manipulation. This just shows um, the similar humeral fragments from the Lissetti chamber, um, the, the LES1 skeleton. Uh, Langdon notes that in addition, the elbows had rotated so the flexion occurs in a parasitial plane in humans. So you're kind of like this sagittal plane is that way and here. So this human torsion occurs in the shaft of humans between the shoulder joint and the elbow, so that it can be measured by the relative facing of two joints. Of two joints. Human torsion is low in all the fossils discussed so far. Human torsion is high in chimpanzees and gorillas, and presumably was independently derived to support the movement of the elbow and knuckle walking. So that so they're suggesting gorillas and chimps evolved it separately in the, because they evolved knuckle walking. The fact that early hominids showed this pyramid condition is an argument against their ancestors having passed through a, a knuckle walking phase. So this argues against that the ancestor of human was not a knuckle walker. So they must so the chimps and um and gorillas must have evolved knuckle walking independently. Now this is a, I think I've got a just look at some oh it does got some of the human torsion values here. So here you can see that humans sort of have sort of 144, immature 137. So if it's immature, so it's, it's a juvenile or subadult, or usually the torsion will increase by a few more degrees. Now you notice that uh, <clears throat> Homo naledi has uh, there's there's three values given: two adult, one immature. Notice one has 91 degree. Now that that's outside any any basically any fossil basic you can see there it's outside gibbons um okay, gibbons are supposed to be the, sort of the, the show the common conditions that uh, i see that the hylobates there it has a 116.6 homo letter has 91 <coughs> and the apes what so why why the apes and and um chimps they're sort of in the more the human range the gorillas are probably even higher than humans uh orangutans you know 135 so that's so basically um, now, the the Australopithecines, they are sort of, you know, 120s, 117 for Acidiba, Afarensis 124. And those are erectus, the, so the Turcatabi is immature, so 111.5, so that would, could likely increase a bit. Um, and and uh, the Damanese erectus, D4167, adult 110, so that's a bit low. Where did that indicate something, a problem in that group as well? Uh, there's um, one as a 104, that would have increased a bit as well. So yes, so I say that the, the, the Homo and Letty one, the, from the Lissetti chamber, its torsion seems, well, it will certainly be normal with respect to the other Homo erectus specimen. 
But the home and elite one, the, even the immature one, is, seems a bit low, would have grown a bit larger. But certainly there's one specimen there that, that is really out of whack, 91. And to put that in perspective, um, a paper by Eckhart et al. commented on the low initial estimate of immaturation in the Homo floresiensis specimen, which had subsequently been revised to a higher value of, of um, 115, 120 degrees, which made it within the range of extended small body humans. Okay, so um, <clears throat> those stated floresiensis of the member of the genus Homo, I'm not going to read it all, should have human torsions within the hom hominid larger apes plus humans range where we're in a healthy normal individual so it's put a value it's more likely to be diagnostic of pathology than uniqueness um so basically numerous studies some sides by reference of by Cargill, document development and influence on the human torsion as a result of various pathologies occupation and sports particularly those involving throwing um now it should be noted that um, that this initial Hobbit torsion value of 110 degrees appears to have been first published in 2005, which was before the publication of the Dominici Rectus torsion values in 2007. And so at the time, a human torsion of 110 appeared to have been the lowest for any hominin, supposed hominin. The interesting now is if some evolution is considered a low human torsion value of 110 degrees to be more likely to be diagnostic of pathology than uniqueness, what does it say about the much lower home and lady human torsion value of 91 degrees? Um, according to Overnorth et al. in their um, paper, human torsion is reduced by an average of 20 degrees in smaller Swiss adult endemic cretins. So this would be consistent with cretinism, okay? So, you know, so people say, where's the evidence of pathology? Well, you, you have to know where to look. You have to compare samples. It doesn't always come gift wrapped with a label on it saying this is pathological. You have to do a bit of a comparison and look at the bones and stuff, but compare them to other fossils, compare them to other humans. Okay. So this indicates that something is not quite right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so now let's look at the um, uh, the ventral, the the shoulder angle of the shoulder. So um, that indicates uh, the ventral bar glenoid angle indicates your orientation of the glenoid cavity, which is a a lower angle indicating that the glenoid is oriented more cranially. For example, uh, in afferensis, it's, it's low ape-like. Uh, Ventral bar glino indicates that the arm was habitually used in an elevated position that would be common during climbing behavior. Um, in a follow up a paper, by, in a follow up paper by on the shoulder by Fugadal on a homoletic shoulder, put that homoletic he had a scapula of a market, markedly cranially oriented glenoid, being as crany oriented as gibbons and more cranial than the great apes, chimps, orangutans, and gorillas. Modern humans, Stralopithecus and Afrensis, Africanus. Sediba and Homo erectus. The authors concluded that Homo erectus has scapula of a marked cranial oriented glenoid, a humerus of extremely low torsion, and a strapifer like clavicle. These traits indicate that the lady scapula was situated superior and laterally on the thorax. This shoulder girder configuration is more similar to a strapifer as a from that of one humerus with scapula position low and dorsally about the thorax. Okay, so this shows the ventral bar glenoid angle here, uh, sort of indicated. Um, there, so that's the angle we're looking at, and, and um, so you can see here that, um, that the larger the angle, the less cranial oriented the the shoulder joint is. So 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 here's Homo sapiens here. So you can see here Homo and Letty one twenty one point one. So that's the same as Gibbons, and you have a various range here. The again the Cadmus skeleton, the, the one that like, same as Afarensis has one thirty four. So that's certainly within the uh, human erectus, well, erectus range is much higher than the other um, afferences, uh, sorry, well, it's not much higher, but it's 134. Aff, aff, uh, it, it's it's um, uh, the uh, afferences of Lucy is actually 132, um, it, and uh, Africanus Africa is 128, 124. Um, so you can see here, there's somewhere, right, actually, the variation isn't that great. Um, 
but certainly um, the, the Takana boys, 137. But note the low value of Homer and Letty. So, so again, we, we, how does this? It's not Homer and Letty would not be as efficient. It's not. It's not an Australia Pithocene. It's not as efficient. Wouldn't it be efficient as climbers as Australia Pithocines, or as a or as a uh, chimp or as a as an orangutan. Why would it have a cranial orientated glenoid much lower? So that so that's one of the the items of interest. Um, so basically. Um, it's a, so they are it's retained its primitive morphology, conducted the climbing. Um, now, I got argue Homer that it could not have been a transition fall between the Australia Hypothesis and later species of Homer, as its shoulder was even more cranially orientated than its hypothetical Australia Hypothesis ancestor. So it can't be a transitional form if it's more supposedly primitive. Um, now, um, the in Williamson and uh, I, when I discussed the vertebrae, I note that the proximal upper rib ends in, in the lady are too incomplete to allow reconstruction of the curvature. However, a strong cranial oriented glenoid and an elevated clavicle and shoulder are suggesting of a narrow upper thorax. This morphology contrasts with evidence for long lower limbs and striding bipedalism and other derived features of the hand and skull. So um, now, despite it, the right lower limb morphology, the elevated shoulder and wide lower forex of Hermonides suggests to us that this species was not adapted to efficient long distance running, uh, suggested as a key trait of Hermonides, while other early activities may have been important aspects of the behavioral repertoire of Hermonides. So, that, so they, they're going for it, so it's arbor real and that. However, However, if a study by Williams that a strong cranial oriented glenoid and an elevated clavicle and shoulder are suggestive of an error hypophorax, this might suggest some sort of development linkage between shoulder girder position and width of the upper thorax. And so someone had a narrow upper thorax due to cretinous discussed earlier regarding rib cage, and I show that here, and basically, and it, in the picture, it certainly seems like the shoulders are quite high. And so if someone had a narrow upper thorax due to cretinism, would that then suggest the person would likely have a cranial orange glenoid on an elevated superior shoulder? Perhaps, but then it would have nothing to do with evolution, but rather a developmental pathology. So, so if there is a developmental linkage between a shoulder girdle and upper forex, then a narrow, then a narrow upper forex, a feature of in some people with cretinous and not all, could potentially explain the shoulder joint being tipped towards the head. All right. So that so that uh, that um, finishes that part. Now I've probably gone quite a bit. So this other part might take a bit too. So I don't know whether to maybe maybe that's something um, the, the the evidence of fire and all that. Maybe that's something that can be taken up next time. I don't know if there's any more question or something, Donnie. So maybe maybe we, we, maybe maybe that's a lot for now. And maybe maybe we can take that up again some other time in the future. That the, the the, the bit about the uh, um, the, the more recent finding of, of the early um, study and things like that. Yes, I think that might be a good idea, especially because that brings us into a lot of the more recent data and information on the Letty yeah. with the controversy going on uh, in terms of the rising car, uh, cave star system, uh, cave system. And so why don't yeah. we get into some questions and since we're at the two and a half hour mark, first thing I want to say that was incredibly comprehensive, uh, Peter. I love it. Uh, that's you. what I like when it comes to these topics. It was technical and probably one of the most thorough presentations and lectures I've seen on the topic. And so that's great. I think this is important. This is exactly what we need. Um, Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there is so much there and I could ask you dozens of questions. So I'll just point out, I took a picture of one of the papers you showed maybe about 20 minutes ago. <clears throat> so I'm pulling it up yeah. here. And again, yeah. it supports what Oxnard was saying earlier. And is, the that, quote, what, is that the one about the, the rib cage? Let me see here. Or, or, I don't know. I, I can exit. I can go back and 
It was okay, the one that's... specifically where it said the primitive features of Homo naledi, rather than explained by evolutionary reversals, are more plausibly explained by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, on, I'm on the different page now. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and it's it says explained by pathology or pathologies, perhaps yeah. involving cretinism. Mm. And so, yeah. another thing I appreciate about your presentation <laughs> is you're backing up everything you're saying. Your hypothesis is supported. Your working hypothesis is supporting by the conventional literature, yeah. citation yeah. after citation. And I think that's incredible. Yeah. So I guess my question would be, you've seen some critics say, well, how can Naledi, the group, how could they be pathological or diseased since you'd expect variation within that disease as in it, it seems um like there's uniformity within the naledi group where they have they've all got these features the small brain size the small body size the curved fingers so on and so forth and and so I, I what would be a good response to that criticism well well i think well there is, as you can see that like of the humeral torsion there, there's actually quite a lot of there was variation in the three specimens presented. Um, one was 91, one was, was 123. So that, so that, so 123 with normal, 191 is clearly out, out of range of pretty much everything. And one was 104 is immature, so probably would have grown by a few, few degrees. Even some of the phalangeal curve, it, it, if you look at the data, it's, 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 a, it's a long, it's, it's, they're not all high. Some are lower than others. Uh, some some are just just within or just outside the human range, depending on what you look at. Uh, so there, there is a lot of vari there is a lot of variation there, and and, and you have to bear bear in mind that um, with cretinism, it, the population it's only between one to ten percent of the population has it, and they can take a lot of different effects in different individuals. So you may not see the same effect in all individuals. So so you can have most of the population relatively normal, but but you may have you know, yeah, I'm thinking about, but there may be, I think, like even Oxenaga in the book with the Hobbit, they don't, they, like in Homo floresiensis, they, they may have grouped together in a cave because they may have been ostracized or whatever. They sheltered in a cave right. together for their own good. And there may be similar thing in, in, um, in the cave system there. They may not, they may not be, there may have been a lot of norm, relatively normal, although I don't, I don't believe they were normal modern humans i believe they're more rectus type humans but they may have they may have sheltered in the cave together they might you know they may have spent more time in the cave because of their condition so so yeah it's it's a one area to look at you know i think i don't think anyone has got a hundred percent grasp on the situation i think more more data needs to come out but to sort of someone to say oh they're all the same well that's not i've demonstrated that humoral torsion is not all the same and and i should look at some of the go Go and right. look at some of the measurements of, of the data to see that there's a like in any any sample of skeleton there's going to be variation and 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 there is and and um even the the perennial capacities that there is so the the large one is 610 the suppose a small composite one is 465 or something so even there there's variation but 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 you know you you, you gotta um we but we don't know the rest of them you know if there was more than 15 individuals so we don't in the, the, the larger chamber we only know reports of uh several uh two composite crania we don't know what what were the what were the measurements of the cranial capacity of all the others so right so yeah uh, so i i i see that there's there's, there's uh there's some uh yeah did they they certainly belong to the same uh but same species uh you know no no one i a few people would argue that the damanese crania and the five crania are different species um they're yes. all the same but there's there's clearly differences one one has obvious pathology the the one with the two floss but even skull five i mean it's it, it's it's so strange that probably that uh, it has the sort of same form on its brain case as the other but the face the face and stuff and the, and the the mandible indicates that, that that could well be a have have, have something a similar effect but we just yeah so that um so so yeah well your so, presentation so. was so thorough and technical uh peter that you essentially countered 
most of the objections that have come in from the critics directly in your presentation. Like that's how yeah. thorough it was. And so I really want to encourage critics yeah. and, yeah. Well, uh, and I, evolutionists I think it, to, to look it over objectively. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, yeah look, I, th I think it's good people people think about it. And, and I, I don't pretend to have all the answers. And, and look, if someone can uh, think, of, think of a more plausible uh, um, explanation, then that's mm. well and good. But you, you've got to start somewhere. So there's a working hypothesis and, and uh, you, you know, um, and and things like that and i think there's i think there's a lot to know to come out of there that are there that we um uh, in the future so it'll be very interesting to, to well i like see, what right? you i like what you say in your article on creation.com puzzling homo naledi and you talked about it here you just mentioned it that these individuals these homo naledi individuals uh being different diseased having uh cretinism they could have been ostracized from their greater community because of that disease. Yeah, and maybe yeah. this was a superstitious community that thought they were yeah. cursed in yeah, some yeah. way. And so yeah. now they're isolated, possibly yeah. in this cave, sheltered there. Yeah. Or part or part of the cave. We, we just we just uh, it's it's just hard hard to know. The may we, we don't we don't know, even know what who was like like the burial thing. Uh, it seems like the, the ones that burial seemed to be this the same form as the others but we don't even know who who was buried was, was it only certain people buried there were right. only pathology buried or was it normals buried we just don't we just don't know uh, you know and, and well, what, i think what, what, what... i think you bring forth a lot of interesting hypotheses to ponder because you've even pointed out that maybe what we're looking at could be some form of euthanasia that they're basically abandoned yeah. in the cave because of their yeah. deformities, yeah. Yeah. and that makes the sense. Thing is what, what, what? The thing is, what if you if you were living that state, say, say there's all sorts of predators around, mm -hmm. and and if it, you know, where would you probably live? You probably, uh, if I was in that situation, the that sort of cave system would probably be a safe place, place to spend the night. Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You know, you wouldn't spend in that tree because you could, you could be you could be eaten by a leopard or something, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and and the thing is, if they their feet was very human and stuff, so so they weren't that adapted to. So 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 you, you can't say that they were really like they weren't orangutans or chimps in terms the climate behavior. That's why I think that there's certainly something pathological, and the, the human torture in values indicate there's something really really strange in some of them, and but also that. Like I said, the the small vertebrae and the small body of the sacrum indicate at least in one that that must have been if it was human it had to be dwarfed because that because it's so so small but it had a relatively large spinal canal which means it, it was sort of um, that was more relatively normal but the very small body which means it, it wasn't uh, so it wasn't as unless it was a some dwarfs dwarfed. If it was a normal stature human, it, it just wouldn't be able to cope. It it'd be have a chronic problems, but back pain because of all the pressure brought on such a small space on on the uh, sacrum's body, you know, and 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 the the small vertebra in that region. So so that so I think I think there's I think that I don't think they're all I, I don't think they're all pathological. I, I think that some are pathological, but but I could have more of them could have sheltered in their cave than than mm -hmm. perhaps the percentage wise in the population because because that was a refuge in that and they were less capable than other humans. Mm -hmm. But I believe there was other relatively normal erectus type specimens mixed up in there. And and it and the thing is you you're doing a a commingled sample uh where you, if you have normal and, and abnormal mixed up and we don't know the percentage and and we right. don't know what other conflated conditions there are you know like i said well, we might not have examples of other individuals in the greater yeah. community if this is just a sub yeah, yeah. group of the greater group yeah and we know that homo erectus was in the area because right. i just showed it and I, I don't accept the dating methods that in fact in dating in that area is all over the place anyhow mm -hmm. they change it all the time and so, the, so this this is uh so basically we know that homo erectus was in the area um and and so I think I think it was a Homo erectus population, but some of them were pathological, and uh, yeah. And, Do you think? Uh, I think, the... more, I think it's, it's a very interesting, and I think you know there's a lot 
a lot of quit there's probably a lot more questions and answers at this point but is yeah. is it possible that one of the many reasons why we see degeneration as being a prominent feature of the hominin fossil record with fluorescensis with naledi specifically i mean we could get into luzonensis is another one because after the flood the post flood rocks could have been higher in um, like uranium for example or other harsh elements that would affect the drinking well, look, water look, the rocks at, at these go ahead i guess that i guess look yeah, I mean that could that possibly could be possibly too. My 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 thing, it, it, it look, it's well possible, and you don't. I guess you've got to take every every situation individually and look. And and, and my right. my thing, the correctness is it is that my my thing against the genetics is that you 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 have you have the same waiting time problem that you, well evolutionists have to getting the, to make the new features. It, it, it takes forever mm. and a day. It can never happen. And so to suggest the same features to explain a population, uh, you know, that, that all these mutations that will occur in a population would take time and move through. So the cretinism don't, don't need that, and, and natural selection doesn't get rid of it because as long right. as the eye is in the environment. But if you had a high dose of radiation, sure, but then the people getting uh, that would, uh, the mutations would probably be different in different people. And, and so... And if it was really high, then probably they wouldn't survive very long, you know. So, so and, and what you're there, saying with with pathology and disease, it, it can manifest rapidly. It, it, there yeah. is no waiting time issue. There, there is no waiting time, yeah. that, except for the if the mother is iodine deficient and doesn't, uh, and that sort of when 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 she's in the period of of, of prenatal prenatal development, uh, then that that's the that's the really uh vulnerable period there and and that's where you know it's, a, it's such a preventable thing and it's and it's a, has a, such a lot of history and as you can show on the maps it's a court all over the world and and mm. because people didn't know about it you know and and so there's a lot of unnecessary suffering and and it's prevalent and 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 if we didn't know about it until recently then how much hundreds or years ago or thousands of years ago what how, you know what would be the case so so but it, look, there's a lot of them, and I said there could be other explanations to your high radiation, mate. That could explain isolated cases and things like that. But if it's too high, it, it could be many like, factors, really, that are yeah. You, you, know, you can get mixture. you can get commingling of, of of pathologies and other factors. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just yeah. It's, so I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, based on <clears throat> I, I find it amazing the images that you showed, specifically the hands and the phalanges. I don't know how anybody could look at. Naledi's hands and conclude that they're anything other than human. Clearly human yeah. hands, clearly human feet, and yeah. the yeah. the phalanges, the the curved phalanges. Yeah. yeah. Is is that also possibly due to the cretinism, low vitamin D, low iodine in the soil? Well, well, well it certainly can be caused by vitamin D. As I gave example, the Mozart, you know, but, uh, right. he wasn't that climbing trees, so it yeah. could be. Um, <laughs> So it could be due to vitamin D deficiency. That's what I said. It could be a conflated disease, but I don't know the, the, how how it effect has a, on cretinism. Now, so if, he, if these were climb people were climbing in the caves, uh, and 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 the, the Naledi is a difficult system. There we go. It could even be explained by that. If you right. if you if you're not getting much sunlight or a poor diet or both, then it could explain particularly in, if you're young, uh, in that age, uh, and. and it could it could explain some of the the, the curvature, you know. I, I don't think they could have possibly with, with the human feet and legs, like they, they couldn't be that mobile in the trees that to develop, particularly the intermediate phalanxes to be more in the medial median value more greater than orangutans. That just doesn't seem doesn't seem plausible to me. And then uh, you have all these other many effects of the humeral torsion, which is much lower than the gibbon which is supposed to be the ancestral condition so so there's all these weird weird things and then yeah um yeah and and then yeah it just doesn't it does it just doesn't match there's a lot of things and and, and even the evolutionists bright bernard would suggesting they they were modern but evolved to be more primitive right so that so that's well, another thing if is already they're deficient in vitamin d they're already suffering from cretinism 
and they're having to climb through these the, this sophisticated cave system that makes sense just due to mechanical stress we know that that yeah. can happen today that, that, that's what the curvature curve. curve is not it's not it's not generally not believed to be genetics that right it's believed to be destroying so that's what i say juvenile apes have more curvature than adult apes you generally if they climb more you know and so basically it's the strain that's put on so if they're doing some strenuous activity i mean even if they I, I guess if you, you know, it, even even if you say you walk around all day holding a, a rock tool all day, that would be grasping your hand. That would put mechanical strain on your hand too. So, and if they were, if their bones are weak, that could cause the same sort of effect. I mean, that's just my speculation, but no, it's a lot of things. Well, I think that's good because uh, phalanges, our fingers are very versatile. They can adapt to a number of different functions yeah. and yeah. activities. So I guess my yeah. question would be, I've heard people say that in order to determine using anatomy and morphology, what is human versus what is ape, we should uh, yeah. look look at fingers, uh, pelvis. But if, if we see in deformed humans, curved phalanges, yeah. uh, a flaring pelvis, are yeah. these good traits, therefore, to determine what is and what is in human? Because clearly Probably we have not. some humans with those traits, no, right? No, because it, it's not. It's not because it, because even in, in the what we would regard as humans, like uh, the Neanderthal and, uh, and Hylobagensis, the if they have sort of flared ilia, although the, the, the concave surface of the ilia, but it, it's also a bit flared laterally. Then uh, right. then obviously we believe they're human, so so that would not be a good indicator. I think. That I mean, uh, not a, I wouldn't say hundred percent, but I think I think having a human foot, a modern human foot, I, I've never seen anything that has a, any fossil, anything that has a hot modern human foot. So that's a, so that to me, it's not a hundred percent criteria. But that I think I think you got to you got to take the package and and look. So so if it has a modern human foot, that's a strong indicator. And then you know, you usually that won't be that won't be due to pathology. So, so that, so, so if you have, if it has a modern human foot, you're not going to get a modern human foot by pathology. You could get curve curvature by pathology and strange effects, but that's an indicator there. Enough, and, and we don't know anything else that has a, a modern human foot. So that right. that certainly is one indicator. And then you can look at the the I guess the lower limb length, although, although that that can be affected by by pathology as well, like like the Hobbit, you know the shorter limb lengths because of cretinism so so that's sort of so so so, uh, so, so you know you look at the features of the skull and things like that you know usually you have a parabolic dental arcade in humans um well with the and, picture that you showed of naledi's hand you can clearly tell that it's human because you have the very long thumb in proportion to shorter fingers, which is unique yeah, to humans. Yeah, yeah. And that gives that's, us our ability to do the that's, pads. That's, that's, that's also an indicator, yeah. yeah. The hand, the hand. I, think, I think that you get a few of these things in comp. One, confer, one, one helps solidify the other. So you take right. a few of these wearables. And that, that's why it took me a long time. I, I spent a fair bit of time when the cut remains come out. Uh, some people really... Uh, almost overnight, the term what is it? Spent about two months looking at it because because it it, it wasn't. Um, some people may jump the gun, think, "Oh, this is just an ape," you know. But you, yeah, but you know, you, when you look at it, you look at well, this has a human foot. You know, you're thinking, "Well, gee, you know, you got to be careful about calling an ape if it has a human foot." And and uh, and so so it's looked at more carefully, and then then you you look at it. What can explain some of these other supposed pyramid features? Anything? Well, maybe pathology can, and it, and then there's, it has the it has these oddities uh, that so, sort of are, are, are not transitional between any australopithecine and erectus or whatever or human, and they're outside the range. And now with the date, it, it it's become a sort of a curiosity because it's, right. it doesn't fit the date either. And it may, who knows whether it turns out to be actually younger, but because the radiocarbon dates were very young, even for evolu in an evolution timeline, and 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 even some of the stuff dated in. Well, interesting thing if they date the charcoal in the chamber, which is supposed to be really young, so so we can see. So it, it it's uh, yeah. So in doing. light of what you just said, it sounds like when it comes to determining, I'm I'm going to put a question up on screen. 
uh, Peter, if you want to come back to the stream yard to see it, in light of what you've been saying and what we've been discussing here, it sounds like we need to take a, a holistic approach to answering this question here. This comes in from Guts at Gibbon. Here's the question yeah. on the screen. What are the physical criteria for designating a human and an ape? Yeah. Well, it says which she would call a human ape. So I don't know what she would call a human ape because, because um, uh, I don't want to put words in her mouth. So, so, but so I, I just look at, you know, I don't, I don't like I said, I don't, I don't. I think you've got to be smart about this. You've got to look at, like I said, the holistic whole package. You take all information that's available, and it, I mean today is obviously you don't. We can just look at somebody we know they're human or not or they're rape so that's it's more the it's more if you look i suppose it's the, the fossils maybe that she's getting at right and yes. uh, i regard uh, properly identified homo erectus as being human because they're associated with tools and they generally and you can actually you can actually link them to ancestors of certain humans and so basically um uh, you know here you know and and, and I'll t i can talk more about that later if i get, and some other talk about homo erectus and and so, actually peter I, ju I just wanted to say take your time with this question i just have to step away from the computer for 30 seconds okay yeah yeah so 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 i think i think uh homo, homo erectus uh which includes which it, or, or broader, a broadly defined homo erectus sensor latu Heart of against us and they're, they're all human robust humans so any any I, that's what i regard it as basically human i don't regard homo habilis as human where i regard as a as a waste basket species most of them even some evolution evolutionists believe they shouldn't be in in homo they should be either assigned to their own genus or in the australopithecines um and, and and that's my feature too although some of them like us uh like the uh the cranium um was it was it sk 847 or whatever from south africa it's like your erectus which sometimes is put in habilis I, I believe that should be an erectus so that so there's some things that are mixed up and some bones that are classified erectus or 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 habilis which are likely erectus but they have no diagnostic cranial elements so you, you can't prove it uh, one way or the other and I, and I, I think when you says it ape, well, you know, it, it's pretty easy to look at what differences, but extant apes and humans today. So, you know, okay, yeah, bottom, bottom there, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so you, you know, if, I think if you want to, if you want to, you know, but uh, you're probably talking about a fossil record, and uh, I don't, I don't actually. Uh, Look at the Australopithecines as apes. So to me, they're extinct apish primates. So right. there are, and that's in line with Oxnard's analysis that showed they were they are actually a distinct group. They're not really closer than your humans, but they're a distinct group separate from apes and humans. And so, so it's like a a triangle, all separate from each other. So, uh, and 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 the, so, some have been some have been some specimens say in Homo like the 1470 man had been tricky. And but because yeah because they were basically um, it, it its face was made to be more vertical than it was allowed for and it should have been so it was made to be more human and which increased its cranial capacity and so we thought maybe that is a human and and later it turns out when they reanalyze it with more prognathic face it's it's as indicated by the late Alan Walker who believed it was just a large brain of Australopithecine. And even its brain shrinks when you when you might put the face on more correctly. So 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 you know I I don't it's it, you you can't really off the cuff go through a whole host of features that differentiate one from the other because bone bones that can be very um, flexible amendable. So right. Um, but that's just in my uh, so I don't want to sort of um, do that. But when you the take cuff. the holistic approach like you've done with Naledi, for example, you've looked at the hands, you've shown how based on the way the, the foot bones are connected and the way the yeah. hallux, right, your big toe is aligned with the other toes. Yeah, okay, yeah. that tells us clearly, Naledi, we're looking at a human. We've got evidence in the feet, evidence mm -hmm. in the hands, 
yeah, evidence. Yeah. So we're taking a sophisticated approach. It's not just a one size fits Definitely. all. That's, a, that's the best approach. And um, but, but the problem is uh, a lot of the specimens there's only fragments, and and you don't really get such a big a sample. And uh, although with the Naledi, it's most perplexing sample around, so right. so sometimes it doesn't help. It's the most controversial one right now, and I think you yep. did. Uh, but, I think, but I think that I think it's some some uh, things that you know are definitely humans that come that aren't caused by pathology, like a human foot, and that you hasn't been seen in other other species, fossil otherwise. That would be a, that, that to me. That's a sort of clear indication that you're doing a likely human. And if you can find other things like human hands, then that then that that adds to the probability that it's human. And then you look at the right. skull, and, and so you go through. And then you look at is there any behavioural indication? So right. when the nearly finds came out, there was none. But now we're coming out. But we haven't. Maybe that next time we, we look at that. But if the, if all these things burials. Even the stone, this this object was close to the hand, uh, which it was found buried in the fires, and the engravings. If that, if they were attributed to Naledi, then 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 only a human could have done all those things. So right. there's a lot of controversy. It's very interesting. I think it's a lot of. I I think he's he's uh, ruffled a few feathers because uh, the, because you see that this doesn't the the finds that Naledi could do these things goes against the idea that only larger brained humans were capable of this and so that's why there's a there's a lot of big big reaction to it and he, well correct and, me if i'm uh, wrong peter e even the endo cast scans of, of the skull have revealed a human brain organization or configuration with naledi um yeah I'm, I'm, I, it may well be yeah i'm sort of I think I've read something about that, and it was a while ago. So I don't want to comment too much on it. I, I'm a, always a little bit wary about endocast because uh, mm. I'm starting a brain, and I know particularly in the frontal region, there's a lot of variability, and, and the endocasts don't capture uh, everything, um, everything, everything in it. And, and the thing is, like, like if, if you look at language, you, you can like some experiments done where they stimulate the, uh, you know, people who. Uh, brain operations and uh, for various reasons and uh, they do some tests while they're there they stimulate parts of the cortex to find what inhibits language or cause of language and i find it's all over the place so mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's not just as typical areas and the blockers which is more speech and stuff or vernicus areas sort of more in the posterior temporal lobe region or, or something like that it's all it's a lot of places um and so 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 to infer too much from a few humps and bumps, is, I, I don't. It, where, it, whether it's, whether it's for or against my position, I, I try not to get, read too much. And it's interesting, but I don't try to read too much into it because I know it's a lot to. It's a four-dimensional issue. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and you sort of you don't want to. It's not a. It's not a. I don't, I don't want to die on that but it hill, so to speak. So no, I completely. I don't, don't, don't want to fight that battle on that hill. That's that's not where. You know, it's, it, yeah. I completely understand. So I've got a question up here from the audience, Doki Doki Bible Club. I appreciate it. And he's asking, are these patterns of pathology and disease that we've been discussing for about three hours here more consistent with the creation or evolution model, Peter? Well, well, I, well I think, I think, well, I, I'm 100% sure what you mean, but we're consistent with it, but, but, I, but I think, but, uh, Usually evolutionists don't sort of um, try to avoid. Well, I did publish studies where they find diseases and things, but they, they don't talk about it too much. They don't look for it because if you have a, a pathological uh, fossil specimen, it's not as uh, attractive as having a new species or something like that. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so I don't think and, and stuff like that. But I, but I think. Um, the, the, if it, it depends on the pathology, you know, like like a like the, the earlier you get to the the uh, the flood and and things like that, um, you'd expect uh, the genome to be actually less 
less mutations in, in the genome right, because it's further from the creation true. went. So that's another reason why, you know, I think environmental effects uh, and look, increased radiation from the flood and stuff could be could be an effect that yeah uh, mm -hmm. that, that influences which speeds up the mutations, but it would probably speed up mutations in different places for each individual unless unless they have offspring which passes that mutation on but then you have uh, and stuff like that but um you, usually if, if it's just a random uh, if it's radiation then the mutations it creates in in the uh, um reproductive cells will be would be random so it's not going to be you're not going to say see the same disorder in similar people if, if you understand what i'm trying to say yes. so so but environmental things and and you know, cretinism wouldn't be the only thing. There's a lot of, I guess, there's other things that 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 that, that uh, can prevent, like like even uh, is it is it high fluorine in the water? If you have a high fluorine, that can sort of inhibit uh, um, uh, the absorption of, of iodine in the body or something. Right. There's there's, there's, there's sort of things like that that not not that that can affect. So so uh, um, so I don't know. I don't know whether. Um, well, I, I would explain it like this too, because Peter, I think your presentation, your arguments are excellent in debunking or countering the evolution position because they hold up these bones and yeah. they argue that, that these are basal or primitive or pre-human, but you're showing that no, yeah. those bones you're holding up that are anomalous, that are interesting, yeah. they're not evidence of anything transitional, they're evidence of pathology, evidence of disease, which gives them that... Uh, deformed morphology so rather than a process of evolution it's a process of devolution in many ways yeah well it's a it, yeah it was an it's just an environmental effect so so mm -hmm. if if they if the next generation get and gets the supplement so then they, right, they can recover normal. from it yeah they, okay yeah but the right. but, but they once, can reverse happened, the negative once it's that. happened once it's happened it's it's hard to that if you if the baby is born, then if it's given thyroxine, um, um, if it's given you know, thyroxine supplements early, then a lot of it, I suppose, could be corrected for. But if you wait for a while, then 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 it's going to be very hard to to you know you might, you, might, you can you can help uh, you, you can help, but but once it becomes an adult, of course, you can't correct it uh, or a certain stage of it. But I, I don't know. It, it's the the effect isn't. Uh, in the genome so it could vary i, I don't know how, how how that so theoretically they could have normal children i suppose if if they weren't subject to uh to um iodine deficiency and stuff like that right but the problem the problem is if it's the mother and and she doesn't have a functioning thyroid then that, that well she probably can't give birth to normal people if, if you'd have to you'd have to give the children sub the fetal uh basically supplement that with with fire or, or give the mother thyroid which passes on to the the fetus at some stage but so it's, it, it is it is very complicated yeah yeah so okay i appreciate that answer next question here comes in from slam rn now i'm assuming our next show together so part three will probably focus more on arachdis neanderthal and possibly what this question is pertaining to heidelbergensis and so the questioner is asking what your thoughts are overall on homo heidelbergensis well well i, well, I think well, well probably next time and probably might my, my, my not be till february because i promised a wife i have a break from not just this but writing and other stuff so. <laughs> of course but probably coming uh on home erectus we'll discuss it and and, and i may finish off the lady section and um i've got a section on the little foot there where i explain why i still believe it's a the the if um the big toe can still be explained divergent that, that the, the new fossil finds uh, doesn't really change my position i was aware of it uh, uh, to me, it wasn't a big deal because it doesn't really change it, and it has been explained by other evolutionists. So I'm just going to use their explanation, and and but that that I'll cover next time. Um, but but to answer the question, no, no, I don't, I don't, I I don't. The only species, a human species, that I recognise, it that includes descendants of Adam Z. It truly is Homo sapiens. So right specimens in the heidelbergensis erectus are you i because it's so used in literature I use them for classification but 
I would class them as a Homo sapiens sensor yeah, to human. put them all in there. And hide them against is that a lot of lot of them, a lot of the specimens there actually were one time or another classified as erectors. And what's happened is that a lot of the erector specimens, once they sometimes they remeasure their brain size or the dates get changed. And and so if the dates get younger, they kind of get pushed into high level again. So is it all um so there's all these different thing variables, but there, there's not really much difference between it. So I'll probably talk more about that next time. So I, I regard erectus and high again as essentially the same. They're robust humans along with Neanderthals and and and, uh, and so yeah I, I don't I don't regard them as a true species uh, you know and and uh, even a lot of evolutionists that it's, it's sort of things where you throw where you don't really want to put erectus because it has a large brain or whatever so you whack it in high against or you know something like that so Peter uh, I've anyway. seen videos I, I've seen lectures from people like Lee Berger where they've held yeah. up these femur bones these massive femur bones he specifically, yeah. if I remember correctly, he pointed out that this belonged to uh, Heidelbergensis, who we we would argue is just human Homo sapiens. But because of the yeah. size of the bone, the femur bone, yeah. uh, Heidelbergensis could have been seven feet tall or or larger. So, mm -hmm. do you think that this is because that these are humans closer to the flood, and so they're more robust? And any thoughts on that, Peter? Um. Yeah, well, I think that. Um, Discuss them more on erectus, but I don't. I don't believe necessarily that they were giant, more more giant in size because humans today can be pretty large too. Right. But I would. But clearly, that the skeleton tend to be more robust, thicker, stronger. The 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 the, the skull bones are more are more thicker layer, mm -hmm. and more robust features in the you know the typical in, in the head and skull, the face, of, like of of height of against as erectus fossil. I, I, I believe, you know, that again, that's very speculative, but, you know, I take the Bible at face value and I believe that that um, the, these, and, and if you look at where, how they're buried and that, that they indicates they were, they were buried, that you find them, they were probably very early uh, post-flood uh, mm -hmm. fossils. I believe they're, they're a, lot, a lot of them may be linked to their parents, maybe, and this is a, erectus may be a more, what we tend to look at some erectus might be a very a specialized version that has genetic drift or wherever the the the, the initial we don't know what how the people looked at coming off the arc i believe they were robust the thick thick uh wall uh thick cranial walls but but you know that you know more like a a large hylobagensis or a neanderthal or something like that i i i don't know it's it's, it's just hard to see are the same and but um that but there was linked to longevity you know even after the flood people lived for hundreds of years or at least the right. biblical records and the thing is currently developmentally you can't that that wouldn't be even you know particularly particularly women in the 40 women men too but particularly women start losing bone mass in the 40s and, and you you see how people when they get if they get into the 90s under how, how they shrink and the loose bone mass so it's not feasible um, to basically um, uh, to 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 the the, the currently the, the current development aging process won't kind of explain it. So I believe God initially in the pre-flood world, you know, developed differently, stronger after the fall um, to cope with this long lifespan and, and being built sturdier to, to me may at least be an advantage in doing that. And uh, it's an area for research, you know, and, and, and things like that. And it would, and so also, of course, the aging process would have to be changed as well, because you, you, you know, so, so there's, uh, but, I, but, I, but I, don't, I don't believe in big coincidences. I believe God must have programmed it into the genome. And, uh, and there's a lot of, space in the genome for that you know only only a small percentage actually codes for proteins a lot of it uh, uh codes for expression of proteins and, and regulation right. of things mm -hmm. and i believe that a pattern of and a lot of it gets back to hormone uh, hormones thyroid hormone which is discussed in cretinism it goes like yeah, sorry just for my yeah go for it yeah no getting annoyed at me because i'm talking <laughs> too much <laughs>
Um, so, You're doing but, good. But, but there's a lot of great information, Peter. But, but there's also there's also out of out of hormones, growth hormone, things like that can explain the big brow ridges and things like that. Um, if, if there's a diff, if there's a different patterns of the hormone release through development, that can explain it. And um, and so that's so so I think something like that occurred. And you know, God knows everything beforehand, so it, it wasn't a coincidence. Um, and so after the flood, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, it's thinned out. Although although these features are still present in some humans, so the, so there may have been a linkage for longevity which is broken, and some features, um, most of it disappeared. But uh, but you know, like you know, and, and but I'll talk more about that. When I discuss Homo erectus and stuff, and so based on what you're maybe. saying, if we were to assume the human morphology in the pre-flood world was exactly yeah. the same as what we see in extant Homo sapiens, we'd be wrong because it sounds like you're saying the human morphology closer to the flood was probably more like a Heidelbergensis rather than yeah, a, so, a extant so, some, something like that. Yeah, something. Yeah, some. You know. You know. Um, because you know, believe it, some of them are quite large brains, so people are worried about that. Don't worry about that. Some of them are correct. Even some erectus like some of them, you know, like I said, the Su Chang one, the Corona, 1800 cubic centimeters. And you know, I so it's not sort of and Neanderthals are very large, so it's not right. so nothing. Roboticity has nothing to do with brain size. Um, so see, so yeah, yeah, I think I think you're looking, so I don't know exact form, but I'm but this is my speculation that you. You, you can't put if you put a modern unless there was something in the environment in them in the pre-flood world that made people live longer and or the early post-flood world then 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 you'd have to it have it, then it has to be something genetic or something like that and so so i believe there's something different but that's my speculation and i continue on in the post-flood world but it diminished and uh and so um and it must have been longevity must have been linked to some of these robust features, um, right, and um, and maybe some of the robust features have continued on, and and um, but the longevity is no longer effect. But but it's because certainly an area of research that <laughs> needed, needed. I find it fallacious <laughs> when evolutionists and critics of young Earth creation are asking us to find human bones in the fossil record going back three to four million years, but that yeah. would be them assuming that humans looked in terms yeah, of morphology, yeah. exactly the same as what we look like today. But you yeah. pointed out, we do find erectus bones in the fossil record. We do find a human morphology that would be expected closer to the flood. Am I correct, Peter? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, if you look at how the sediments, some of these buried are quite deep. So whether it's um, from a post-flood ice age or uh, mo most likely, or you know, um, right. I, I don't hundred percent rule out that these were actually some of them. Whether some of them actually represent remains from the flood, they, they were buried in the flood. I I don't I can't be I can't hundred percent rule it out. But I I I base in my analysis on the on the premises that they they're all post flood. Mm -hmm. but most of them are early post flood because because of just a state of fossilization and things like that. Right. And where you find them, and you generally find the modern ones. Uh, you know, buried on top of them, or, or, or in different areas. So, 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 look. Relatively speaking, the modern. I don't know when. You know, likely they were they were all at Babel or whatever. But you know, and and what happened? You know, how the. You know, where where you know where where the, where does some? I, I don't know where the, it says. You know, the, the humans are spurred from Babel. Now, I, I don't know whether there were humans before. There were of course, humans existed before Babel. Now, whether some humans small small groups migrated before that and and these are, represent some of the the, the finds we'll find in remote regions and then right but most of them were at Babel I don't know the Bible the Bible isn't you know it, it it gives a general picture but it doesn't give the complete picture by any means um so you kind of you got to work work out it's, it's not right. a, it's not but but uh, it's most yeah, it's, it's so. most certainly uh, possible that a small tribe or a small family migrated before the dispersal at Babel and yeah. became isolated, like with uh, yeah, yeah. Hobbit, yeah. as you've talked about, Luzon and yeah, may, may have been isolated by the ice, ice age, yeah, occurring north if they had gotten very, you know, so so it, it may, it, it, yeah, so a lot, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of things that are unknown, you know, and uh, uh, interesting, inter interesting things to follow up and, and, and look at. But but I, but I think if you're going to take the 
if you if you're following a biblical model, then then you can't ignore it because that might things like that because that might be the key. So if you right. if you, if you know you can't and ignore longevity in any model of human origins because that that seems like a key factor. And under you have to understand. So so it must have played some factor because Absolutely. obviously we can't we don't live for that long now and we're not designed to. But maybe in the past we were. But don't but. Or those genes, or my, or maybe just the the pro, whether not necessarily genes, but the the re regions that regulate it, that behavior is is shut down or, right. or gone or something. But it, it, yeah, it's speculative. But yeah, but but I will emphasize ideas about evolution are very very speculative. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Not... Amen. Well, we've had presentations on this channel from uh, presenters who specialize in longevity. And they've pointed yeah. to a number of uh, longevity genes that are currently broken or turned off. And so if yeah, you were yeah. to just turn those on in a pre-flood environment, then that yeah. could be enough to increase lifespan. Yeah, it might, it might well be, you know, we just, we just, uh, but it, it, it might, it might be, but, uh, um, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. and and. I don't know whether that would turn on the robust things as well, or maybe not. We just um, we just don't know. But it's right. an interesting area of research. So, so so it's good that people are hopefully looking at that more more deeply. But there's a yeah. lot of research. That's why it's it's a good time to be a biblical creationist, brother. And yeah, yeah, big definitely. science fun. There, there's so many working hypotheses yeah. and ideas. So this question, yeah. uh, Peter, comes in from Sandy C. Now I will give a disclaimer. Peter, in part one, which is linked in the description box, you spent yeah. a considerable amount of time on the Laetoli footprints. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would recommend people check that out. But for maybe a more brief answer here, yeah, Sandy yeah. C is asking, do you think the Laetoli footprints are human? Uh, yeah, well, uh, there's actually two types of sites, GNS. Um, one is smaller, one is a bit larger. I believe they're human, yes. There's a site A, which indicates an apish creature with a, a more um, divergent or opposable big toe, I believe they were made by Australopithecines. Okay, I don't necessarily believe that. I believe that even existing apes, or even apes supposedly that existed millions of years before the Australopithecines, could have, have some form of, of bipedalism. Uh, I don't believe they were necessarily obligate, obligatory or habitually. But but some sort of optional, and so they couldn't. So and I believe the Australopithecines were capable of, of optional of hedonism. In fact, a lot of the design was likely made for uh, climbing uh, bipedal um, climbing, walking in tree tree branches to collect food and stuff like that. That that would that's a good form of, uh, um, you know that that that'd be very handy because to be able to, to grab fruit or whatever. Um, so, so I don't. So, so to me, to me, that now evolutionists recognise that also there's two, there are two distinct forms. And they, they have not, not all, not all. Of the, some, a lot of them believe because of their model that there has to be Afroensis or some other Australopithecine that made the site S and G prints because humans didn't exist there according to the model. So they can't say it's human. But there are some evolutionists. Who say, pretty much say they're almost pretty much indistinguishable from modern human footprints but i still can't assign them to humans so that so so that's the evidence is actually being rejected and the, the and and so the most simplest parsimonious explanation is rejected for to fit the narrative rather than what the evidence indicates and uh, and so uh, so to me um i don't because i'm not my lens is not evolutionary I believe they were human, but there were some Australopithecine ones to site A, which which are clearly different, and they and and so you, and that would put Australopithecines and humans together, right? And 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 as as with that uh, the Kadamu skeleton, the partial skeleton found in um, I think it's Ethiopia or whatever, that that uh, indicates that there were actually in the evolutionary timeline. Humans that lived about 3.58 or 3.6 million years ago, and that that would totally catastrophically collapse the whole thing. So they can't assign it to 
uh, or rectus or anything uh, but it's uh, it, it's missing its uh, feet and lay and um, feet and hands and its head so it can't be diagnosed diagnostic of anything but a lot of features indicate it's it's rectus like it's human like and, and so um so i believe that is evidence but 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 it's, it's but basically the things like that is discarded it's, it's so so that you know it's the same like with the rectus crania i say there's no large rectus crania but of course there won't be if if your definition is there that if anything is too large and it's not by by automatically um excluded from rectus and then the claim there are no like rectus uh large crania but if you exclude it from its definition then of course there won't be any large home rectus crania so it's a lot of circular reasoning involved in all this stuff um yeah so i think that hopefully that hopefully that answer my question but you can you always look at the part one or whatever absolutely and you have slides and sources and a great yeah. presentation in part one so what you said is in the hominin fossil record we see overlap coexistence intermingling with your mm. homotypes your australopithecine types and mm. as you've said if those are truly human footprints well mm. okay you can have your parents grandparents and children coexisting but yeah. i can't be coexisting with my great 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 grandparents right yeah. and that's basically yeah. what the evolutionists would have with, with yeah. this kind of coexistence so that, the, 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 yeah the humans would be on the scene before um you, yeah it's like you 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 existing before your grandfather right <laughs> <laughs> so i i guess what we'll do here because i want to respect your time and this has been comprehensive is we'll do one last question and i think it's yeah. a good time to get this question in because yeah. it kind of relates to the laetoli footprint issue yeah in the sense that and we talked about this a little bit last time with littlefoot yeah. australopithecus prometheus i think if i'm not mistaken some yeah. still consider it africanus but they'll say the um hallux the big toe is more in line and they'll use that as supporting evidence to say that the laetoli footprints there, there's a couple different uh, sets yeah. of use as you've said could certainly be uh, that of an australopithecine primate all right well would you well my wife's talking out of the phone there so maybe she so i can probably get away with doing a few more minutes uh so do you want me to go to the section on that in the presentation and that'll be easy to answer that sure yeah if, you, if you'd like to yeah you know, you're talking about the st the little foot um, uh, footprint so yes, the question is that, I, I could iterate the question so the question is basically i got it up on screen and then you can go to your presentation from gutsy gibbon sent this in uh, beforehand i'd also yeah. ask if he's read on STW573's new material. So we can just address yeah. Littlefoot in general, if, yeah. if you'd like to. I'll, I'll, all right, I'll, I'll uh, and I can get your slides up. Be a separate, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that specimen, there's no, it, the pictures aren't available for general consumption, so I can't show a lot of the stuff, but I'm just finding a thing here. Um, all right so what i can do i can uh, you got it there yes i can see the the prometheus so, skull. So what i'll do is I, I won't do the full presentation i can do the initial part which i think addresses some of the which addresses the foot and then i'll leave it at that okay okay that sounds great okay so 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 this this is the little foot skull stw573 and uh Allegedly dated about 3.678 million years ago. So I kind of go for some of the, some of this. So it's said to have more than 90% of its bones intact, um, say part of its feet, pelvis, and kneecaps. And um, initially discovered when Ron Clark uh, was looking for uh, some of foot, uh, looking for it, or found its foot bones in, in some boxes of animal bones. In a, and basically say so it's kind of discovered uh for looking for boxes and and in 1997 he found more fossil bones in boxes of its medical school and then they from that they looked in a cave and they found this skeleton encased in rock and spent over a decade or more excavating it uh, pretty tedious work um so um okay so uh, Michael Marshall Coach Clark saying, I spent 20 years getting the skill and finding it in rock in the dark, deeper darkness of the cave, locating every bone and then cleaning it sufficient so we could identify them in the cave. 
undercutting them, bringing them out of blocks, cleaning them, reconstructing them. Now, in an initial analysis of the of the uh, articulated foot bones, um, I think there's just four of them initially. It's, it's uh, Clark and Tob Philip Tobias, so, so both big in uh, pale paleoanthropology world. So, so that its most remarkable characteristic is that the great toholax is appreciably, appreciably merely diverge virus and strong immobile as in apes. So basically, it had a divergent big toe. So the left first metatarsal has a high concave proximal facet to receive the convex facet of the medial cuneiform, which implies a mobile first cunometatarsal joint. When the metatarsal is locked in the position of the medial cuneiform, it is angled medial board in the virus position. This provides powerful evidence that the hallux diverged from other toes. Okay. And I said it's becoming clear that Australopithecus was likely not, not an obligate terrestrial biped, but rather a facultative biped and climber. Um, the exact proportion of the activity spent on the ground in trees is at present indeterminate. So they so they were turning so that so the diagram there shows how they, how how they were interpreting it. Okay. Then then in 1997, they found more fossils in a box, and basically they found a, an intermediate cuneiform, the fit of the medial cuneiform, and they found the lateral left lateral cuneiform, and the proximal end of the left second metatarsal. And the left distal fibula. And I state here, uh, Clark states, here was yet another indication of the ape like morphology of the SDW5, SDW573 foot, complemented by the three cuneiforms that were also more ape like than human like. So I now have a total of 12 foot and lower leg bones of one ape man individual, the left tibia and fibula, which joined to an articulate set of eight foot and ankle bones. Uh, okay, so to, just leave it that. All right. Now, upon finding the additional foot bones, there was later disagreement with the divergent hallux interpretation. So that was sort of covered in this article with De Silva in, in 2018. He knows that the hallux is not divergent and instead is aligned with the second metatarsal, making that little foot at 3.67 million years ago the oldest known hominin fossil, foot fossil with an adducted hallux. That is a big toe and all the others not divergent or opposable. He said, furthermore, we note that when the STW573 foot was compromised of a talus and navigate the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal, the arrangement of these bones could produce the illusion of a divergent hallux. So, that, so they were just hallucinating this, or um, not hallucinating, but um, they weren't interpreting that they, they, they could have given an illusion of it. However, the recovery of a the other cuneiforms and the second metatarsals, the articulation of these elements produces a foot incapable of hallucinal or hallucinal or hallucinal divergence, however you pronounce it. The intermediate cuneiform nestles into an angle medial cuneiform facet as it does in humans, and the second metatarsal is not only parallel to the uh, first metatarsal base, but has a small contact facet on its medial shaft for the addu adducted me first metatarsal. In some, the hypothesis that STW573 had a divergent hallux has been refuted. If the age of this fossil at 3.67 million years ago is accepted, the importance of this fossil is not that it had a divergent hallux, it did not, but it would be the oldest known hominin foot fossil of an adducted great toe. So, so the, the sort of saying, so, well, it's not the oldest um, um, uh, known hominin fossil, foot fossil, but it has, it's the old. Um, um, it, it basically it's the oldest known hominid foot fossil when they had like a great toe, and that would means they have they have they could have one that say fitted the Laetoli footprints. Okay. Now, yeah, yeah. So the, now to to explain this, I'm going to go to another um, set of bones called the Oldeby hominid hominid eight, and they, these left which is a very similar situation. These left foot bones were discovered in 1960, and the find was first reported on by Lou Saliki in the same year. But the first detailed description was by Day and Appy in 64. They noted that the uh, the 12 bones of the foot were identified in the video examined and afterwards articulated. So that's why I'm showing a picture there, not articulated, because that's how they came. They weren't sort of uh, fossilized uh, together. They were individually fossilized cleaned and then put together. 
They state that the presence of an articular facet between the base of the first and second metatarsals demonstrates unequivocally the absence of the hallucinal divergence with, which characterizes non human primate feet. So they're asking, they're saying it's uh, basically um, the, it was, there was no divergence. The, the first toe was abducted, the others, okay? So the, the, with, the, with the little foot, it's different because the, the people have found that we're, we're, they were saying it was divergent. Here they're not. Yet this disagreement, um, other evolutionists disagree with even the interpretation of OHH. So, um, but but it's you. But the thing is, ever since it's usually been assembled to make the first metatarsal appear in line, adducted with the others, meaning it had a non-opposable hallux big toe feature of humans. However, expert in foot like evolutionists O.J. Lewis have illustrated how it's possible to reconstruct the OHH foot with a divergent metatarsal abducted, thus yielding an opposable hallux. Now I don't know where this was. This was a while ago, so I don't, I don't know whether O.J. Lewis is still alive or not. But he seemed to know a lot of the foot. So here he shows the reconstructed OH8 foot. He notes great play has been made of the presence of this apparent join between the first and second metatarsal and the OH foot. So this is similar to what you're talking about in the little foot uh, situation. It has been cited as a feature demonstrating unequivocally or indisputably the lack of divergence of the hallux. Articulations between these two bones certainly are quite frequently encountered in human feet and indeed. One was present in the foot shown. They wear a considerably in refinement of structure, often being more of the nature of a pseudoarthrosis, uh, basically an, an apparent joint, with a thin and oval cavity or bursal type and quick fibrous or fibre cartridges or pads fashioned from ligamentous attachments, forming the emergent articular surface on the opposed bones. So basically, a bursa was formed. Bursa help reduce friction, but tissue, tissue rubber, sort of ligamentous tissue rubber against, against other tissue, which in this case, presumably the bone. Now, this, 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 this diagram here, I'm just pointing to the empty one and base. This is the human foot, but it shows all the ligament stuff in there around. The, that's a dorsal view of the foot. Uh, so there's a lot of ligamentous material in the bottom there. And if you look at the... Um, the ventral inferior view, you can see there's, there's also ligaments, there's also tendons and stuff can they're all connected connected to it. Now, Lewis goes on, it is quite apparent that the impressions on the um, adjacent first and second metatarsal of the AH foot similarly are basically a ligamentous one. By analogy, the comparable, comparable human example, there's little doubt that a rather rudimentary synovial joint was present. When, however, the foot is reconstructed with due allowance being made for the probably quite thick fibrous and the rest of the bones, it is clear that the hallux would be somewhat divergent. Moreover, when the first tarsal metatarsal joint is brought into close, co close packed position, some divergence of the hallux is quite obvious, and the form of the conarticular surfaces is quite in accord with some residual, residual grasping function. Now, a bit later, uh, another evolutionist kid comments on this. He says the presence of a divergent first ray has been previously ruled out because of the presence of an articulation between the bases of the first and second metatarsals. While such an articulation is present in the human foot and absent in the ape, it is possible to plausibly reconstruct the first ray of fossil in a divergent manner and still have an articulation between the two bases. Lewis points out that great play has been made over this apparent joint in OH8 and notes that in modern humans, this articulation is frequently more of a pseudoarthrosis. Lewis continues to point out that in a reconstruction of OH8 foot, with due allowance, allowance for ligamentous materials, the hallux will be somewhat divergent. It is perhaps an appropriate comments, it is perhaps an appropriate moment to challenge the accepted notion that articulation between the base of the first and second metatarsals and equivalent is unequivocal evidence of non hallucinal divergence as suggested in Day and Napier and Day 1978. Perhaps the truth of the matter would seem plausible. From this study is that this foot does possess a divergent first ray but of somewhat different pattern to that observed in extant apes and i don't regard the australopithecines as as, as a different primate group to extent apes anyhow support for this line of argument has recently emerged of the description of a new fossil sandwich from stirk fontaine consisting of the medial column bones, dentalis, nuclear, medial cuneiform, and first metatarsal. While differing in some details from the medial assembly of OH, 
Eight, the conclusion with regard to the first row and common vows that has retained some degree of divergence commensurate with at least a component of an arboreal lifestyle. Now that was written before these other bones were found, but they're using, they, 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 they seem to uh, agree that it was agreed, or at least he, the authors of this paper agreed that the uh, the Sturk font and the, the little foot, um, its big toe ha had some divergence and grasping function or whatever. Hence the apparent joint impression on adjacent, getting back to the S, the little foot bones, the STW 55 63, hence the apparent um, joint impressions on the adjacent first and second metatarsal bases of the STW 570 foot may well be basically ligamentous ones, allowing for the likely thick fibrous tissue, that is ligamentous material coverings, investments of the bones. The STW 575 first, 73 first ray, first method, which is the first metatarsal and the first cuneiform bones, could plausibly be reconstructed in a divergent manner. Hence, the hallux big toe could have had some divergence consistent with some grass and function and an arboreal lifestyle. The foot bones of, of, of little foot can be interpreted in various ways. So it must be in mind that the evolution experts have, experts have bias, the many are pushing the viewpoint that Australopithecus foot was evolving to be human-like. And so they will look for ways to interpret the bones to suit that model, and that's included non-divergent hallux, that is a non-opposable big toe like in humans with limited grasping ability. The initial study which indicated that the hallux big toe and little foot diverge from other toes support the position that STW573 belonged to an Australopithecine apish primate which had some grasping ability of a big toe in line with its other real lifestyle. Now, if you get back to more recent stuff, the, the the group has published more recent papers. I'm not going to go through it all, just covering the foot because because of time thing. Uh, maybe I can finish it off for some other time. And they, they note that in SDW3 bony labyrinth, butadale found a mixture of ape-like and human-like features within the semicircular class and cochlea, respectively, and suggest that it's obligatory bipedalism, bipedalism appeared with some degree of arboreolism. The first, and I note, the first four foot bones that led eventually to the discovery of this complete skeleton were published by Clark and Tobias, 1905, who observed that there was some degree of mobility at the joint of the medial cuneiform of the first metatarsal. They concluded this mobility of a hallux would have assisted in arboreality. Uh, now, if if they the if the authors of Clark, if they if I didn't believe this anymore, you think that they why would why wouldn't they say so? Why would they still go over this position? And in another paper published in uh, two, that published in in 2019, in 2018, uh, Crompton and Al saying the available foot bones. Uh, this again the Clark group. Available foot bones of SDW573 have been discussed in detail by Clark 1998, 2002, Clark and Tobias 1995, and Dellison 2004. The portion of general morphology broadly resembled those from Ronza and, and Miller. And the highly functional plasticity of the human hallux discussed above must be taken into account in any discussion of hallucinological function. Uh, oh, sorry, and resemble once a mile and the kicker. Now, the once a mile, that's the Bertel foot bones. Uh, these dad, they told it to be 3.4 million years ago, are said to be more similar to the earlier Artificus ramidus in possessing an opposable great toe. So they're, they're saying it has a general morphology similar to Bertel foot, which has an opposable great toe. So why again wouldn't they disown their position rather than seemingly agreeing with it if if, if this had been disproven? And he, and basically here, here this is the Bertel foot, okay? It was it would be contemporaneous in time with Astrophicus afferensis yet. It wasn't a sign to that or any tax on because it didn't match the inferred locomotor adaptations. Uh and so, so because it, it possessed an opposable great toe, so 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 there's a lot of things, uh, yeah, you know. And and the dicker, the kicker uh, thing as well is Juno Afarensis. Um, they said uh, they also had medical cuneiform, cuneiform traits associated with increased hallucinal mobility. So it means they could move the big toe a bit and more graceful, graceful calcium tube, which. It's then expected on the basis of known adult morphologies. And, and basically, um, the, the junior afferents had, may have had more hallucinal mobility and abduction ability in, than adult afferents as modern humans. Um, and, and as I say, this, this sticker 11 provides evidence for a habitual bi 
Vidali and combined with some pedal grasping. So again, if it's if the SCW 574 is compared with the the, the Bertal fort and the, and the Dika, the Kika, um fort, a juvenile fort, both of them, uh, according to the people published on it, had some uh, ability of the big toe to allow some sort of grasping or whatever, and and uh, divergence. So I don't think that uh, the, the it has been demonstrated at all that the that the that uh, the, the little foot had a non-divergent big toe. And think, in fact, it can quite plausibly be reconstructed uh, the other way. Okay, so I think I I think I'll leave it out there, uh, Donny. Uh, that's about. Uh, I can maybe discuss some of the other stuff another time. Absolutely, uh, Peter. Many in our live chat today uh, are providing a lot of positive feedback and saying that you have uh, incredible endurance going on almost four hours and you look like you could do another four hours, Peter. So I have my triathlon. Uh, my, my, my triathlon background. I used to do Ironmans. Yeah. <laughs> I am amazed at the amount of research you've put into this. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage the audience to not only share this show around, but also part one, which received a lot of good feedback because that's roughly seven and a half hours of technical talk and technical presentation on the hominin fossil record. And this was a need that I saw. This was a gap, I think, in the world of YouTube. We didn't have enough uh, technical information out there on this issue. And you have filled that gap, uh, Peter. You've done an excellent job over the last two programs. Truly a blessing, my brother. And I think we'll just hand it over to you if you had any final words or final thoughts. I think you adequately addressed the Littlefoot objection and the Littlefoot uh, mm -hmm. argument. And and we'll further discuss that, you know, sometime next year in February. Yeah. Is, is there any yeah. anything you'd like to add before we wrap things up, Peter? Uh, not really. I think I think a, a lot of case, uh, you know, uh, you you could, when these things come out, some sometimes it sometimes you ha you kind of you, you got to sometimes sit back a bit and see what unfolds because. Uh, Initially, a lot of hoopla's made a lot of the initial descriptions right. and, and things, and then things change, and people have different ideas, different reconstruction, different dates, different things, and different even if the latest stuff that's coming out now. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, think what appears to be evidence for this and that may not be. So I think that pe people, ultimately, the things that doesn't change is God's word, and that's um, you know. Amen. The interpretation might change. I'm I'm a fallible human being, so so you know, but God's word doesn't change. So, I, I, you know, I 100 believe in God's word and 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 you know, that God exists uh, and Jesus Christ is alive and uh, and so um, I have no doubts about it. And, and and so that's that's what I would point to. But but uh, but yeah. So I don't really have much more to add. But but that yeah. Peter, if I could ask you before we wrap it up, just because I was so fascinated with your presentation and your uh, working hypothesis on Naledi, mm. if you did speak to this paper, I apologize, I missed it. I, I was curious as to your thoughts from the Eric Trinkus paper uh, titled, well, he, he goes into developmental abnormalities and anomalous features yeah. in the hominin fossil record and he's basically yeah. it's like a surprise you know why but i feel like this would support your hypothesis do you feel the same or i think i've seen that paper there. there's, there's a lot of stuff there uh, but i've uh, been a while ago it says they're kind of 75 documented uh yeah there, there, is, there is a lot of things in in the fossil record i think i think so so i think people when you say pathology or whatever that, that people think I, it, it's sort of it stands out like a sore farm and that, but you, you kind of have to look careful, more carefully at the bones, and you got to compare it. You know, something isn't that obvious. You know, and we're looking at fossils. A lot of the soft tissue is gone, cartilage is gone, a lot of stuff in the bone. You know, we don't, you know, and so so a lot, so a lot of the end, ends of the bones are gone. So we don't even know. So so there could be there could be obvious stuff, but it hasn't fossilized. You know, so there's a lot of a lot of factors there, but 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 yeah, there, there, there's a yeah there is. Certainly, there is a lot of, you know, we know that diseases seem to have always been there, you know, tumors and stuff, and you know, um, um, 
in 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 his fossil so this disease has always been with us and 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 as you mentioned earlier uh, a, a good point that the early flood environment and, and may have been sort of high in, in certain radioactive elements in certain in certain areas so if you if you parked your your boat there there may not be a good place we we have today you know radon and stuff like that in certain right. places that may not be help you know so so yeah so so yeah that's a good point I, I, yeah i'm about to finish okay <laughs> well i appreciate it and make sure uh peter to thank your wife uh for us as well i'm yeah, very thankful the audience is very thankful uh yeah. we feel blessed to have yeah. uh you appreciate here it. and you've been yeah. so generous with your time so we're going to wrap it up yeah. here god bless you peter uh god thank bless you, your yeah. wife i really appreciate it and also uh to the audience thank you uh for tuning yeah. in god bless yeah. all standing for truth is yeah. out